be the next prime minister. The polls close in Britain in about five minutes at 10 p.m. local time, and that's when the first exit polls will be released. Now to our simulcast of the BBC. Good evening, and what an extraordinary campaign it's been. It began as a two-horse race, it ended with three starters at the line. And in four minutes' time, when we have our exit poll, we'll have the first indication of who's the winner, if indeed there is a clear winner. Whether David Cameron becomes the first Tory Prime Minister in 13 years, whether Gordon Brown returns triumphant to number 10, or whether it's Nick Clegg who, in effect, acts as the kingmaker. There are 650 constituencies, which each sends one MP to the new House of Commons. An electorate of just over 45 million people, whose votes will be counted at nearly 450 centres throughout the United Kingdom. Towns and cities, countryside and suburbs. And we've got our cameras at more of them than any other broadcaster. And a team around me here, the engine room, that will analyse these results as they come in. Some of our top reporters are with the party leaders. Andrew Marr is with David Cameron. Kirsty Walk with Nick Clegg. And John Simpson following Gordon Brown. And Jeremy Vine will open the doors into his virtual world to display the results in all their glory. Can David Cameron pave the way to number 10? Here are our paving stones flying into Downing Street. Each one of them has a constituency on it. The seats the Conservatives need to win to get Mr Cameron to the end of the street. They need 116 extra seats for an overall majority. And here they are. And if they win them in order of difficulty, the last one is Waveney. And if they get them, Mr Cameron is then up the stairs he opens the door, and as Prime Minister, he goes in. There'll be plenty more of that to come. And Jeremy Paxman is here to talk to the big political beasts. Yes, up here on the naughty step, we shall have a constantly changing procession of winners and losers, of battle-weary veterans and eager adventurers, finding out from them what this decision we've made means and what will happen to us now. And by the London Eye, with a spectacular view across the Thames to the Palace of Westminster, Andrew Neil will be talking to some familiar faces. Yes, throughout the night I'm going to be talking to an eclectic mix of opinion formers and celebrities, including Piers Morgan, Simon Shammer, Ian Hislop, Bruce Forsyth, Joan Collins, Ben Kingsley, and maybe, just maybe, a few surprises. Fiona Bruce will be keeping us up to date, hour by hour, with what's happened and the BBC's political editor Nick Robinson with sharp comment on the future of British politics. Politicians on all sides are expecting a result that makes history. Either the first Tories to eject Labour from government in three decades, or a stunning political comeback for Labour, or an uncertain result which could lead to days of haggling, a deal, even a coalition. And the argument about who has the right to govern could start tonight in here. And to look at any one constituency in this election where every seat matters, Emily Maitlis. Yes, one big headline result, but there will be clues along the way to help us get there. My team will be sifting through those 650 individual races to see which results start spelling out the big picture. And this machine will help me show you. Here is how we voted last time round. What colour will we paint the country this time? Stay with us as I show you what your vote has done to this map. Now, in a moment, as Big Ben strikes 10, we'll be able to give the result of our exit poll. For the first time, not an opinion poll, not people saying how they intend to vote, but people answering the question after they voted. How did you vote? We went to 130 different polling places to find this out. But remember, this is only an exit poll. If it was dead accurate, there'd be no need for anybody to go and vote. 10 o'clock. And this is what we're saying. It's going to be a hung parliament with the Conservatives as the largest party. And the figures, the Conservatives on 307, short by 19 of the 326 they'd need for an overall majority. Labour on 255. The Liberal Democrats on 59. And others on 29. 
And uh, if that's right, the Liberal Democrats, despite all that noise and fury, have actually dropped three seats, which could be one reason why you need to be a bit skeptical about this exit poll. To make it up, NOP and Mori spoke to 18,000 people in 130 polling stations in England, Scotland and Wales, and they did it for the BBC, for ITV News and for Sky. All these polls, of course, have a small margin of error, which could be significant in a tight election like this. In fact, we're almost on the cusp of knowing what actually has happened. Three main Westminster parties so close in the opinion polls right through, and possibly so close tonight. And there could be different voting patterns around the country. Of course, the exit poll, again, tries to take account of that, but it may not necessarily have got it right. Different people voting in different ways throughout the UK. Everybody agrees this has been a very complicated election. There's the exit poll. It's just a start. Everything to play for. When the first result's coming in, it could be a different picture from the one we're showing here. Nick. Well, drama, excitement, uncertainty is guaranteed by that exit poll, David, uh, because the Tory party there just short of what they need for an overall majority in the House of Commons. Now, if the poll is wrong slightly, they may find that they can indeed hold power. Even with those numbers, they would probably govern successfully as a minority government. Wrong in the other direction, though, and the possibility comes that if indeed the Liberal Democrats do much better than that poll suggests, as many people would expect them to, that there is just the slightest possibility that Gordon Brown could try and hold on to power by coming to an arrangement or indeed a formal coalition with the Liberal Democrats. I mean, what we know is that those exit polls are based on uniform behaviour. And if that is not right, if that does not happen, what we know is we're in for an extremely interesting night. Nick, true, true, so true. Now, we've got an innovation this year, big innovation. We've managed to project onto Big Ben, for the first time, the results as they come through. There is Big Ben in the tower. Big Ben, of course, referring to the bell, not the tower itself. And the BBC's exit poll is there, projected on there. And as the results come in, we will continue to put them up there at the very heart of Parliament. And they have to reach that 326 for a majority, which, of course, they haven't at this stage under the exit poll rules. The Tories on 307, Labour on 255, the Liberal Democrats on 59, others on 29. Now, it's just after 10 o'clock, and there's a race on now for the first result. The first result's going to be very important to us. The first few will give us some indication of what's gone on. As you know, it's always places that are safe Labour seats uh, that go first, or possibly Torbay, but normally Sunderland, safe Labour, but nevertheless our experts look at those and analyse what change there's been, and our helicopters are up there in the sky, spotting ballot boxes being taken in the cars and then rushed to the count. And Sunderland in particular, Houghton and Sunderland South, we expect to be the first to declare, uh, we'll be up there with our reporter in a moment and try and get that result in. Now we're joined by Michael Gove for the Tories and Harriet Harman for Labour. Uh, Mr Gove, have you heard our exit poll? What do you make of it? You do this. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Uh, Harriet Harman, I'll come back to you, Michael Gove, in a moment. I think your microphone may not be working. Harriet Harman, what do you make of this exit poll? Well, as I left my constituency a few minutes ago, people were still queuing at the polling station. And I think up and down the country, people are just, just finished closing the polling stations. And every vote will need to be counted. Every constituency will need to be declared. It's obviously going to be very close. But I think what is clear is that the country does need a strong and stable government to take us through the recession. And the country hasn't turned overwhelmingly to the Conservatives and given them the trust and confidence that the Conservatives were predicting a, a year or so ago. Is the implication of what you're saying that if it is a hung parliament of the kind we, uh, the exit poll is suggesting, not us, and that if it were per possible for Labour and the Liberal Democrats together to form a government, that that would be the right way to go? Is that what you're suggesting? 
No, I'm just saying it's too early to say because literally the polling stations up and down the country have only just closed and each individual vote has to be counted and each individual count has to be declared. I mean, this is in a way a moment for a bit of humility from political commentators and political parties. The public will decide and then, obviously, we need to have the strong and stable government. We need to follow the constitutional conventions to get that strong and stable government to take us through the recession. But I think it's been clear that there is a general feeling that we need to change the voting system. Thanks very much, Harriet Harman. Changing the voting system on Harriet Harman's agenda. Michael Gove, Shadow Schools Minister. What do you make of this exit poll? It's a bit disturbing for you after this campaign, isn't it? I wouldn't say it was disturbing. I think Harriet is right that all of us should show a degree of humility at this stage. The polls have only just closed, and as Harriet pointed out, we need to see the real results. Exit polls in the past have sometimes given us uh, rogue results, so we need to treat it with caution. But what I do think is that it's another piece of evidence, alongside the evidence that we've been picking up during the day, which suggests that there's a comprehensive rejection of Gordon Brown and the Labour government, and a strong vote for change. Harriet is right that we do need a strong and responsible and stable government to steer us through the economic difficulties ahead. But it's pretty clear that the British people believe that Gordon Brown is not the person to lead that government. Do you hold out uh, hope still of having a governing majority of getting the 326 that you need? Uh, I absolutely believe that it is possible. Again, the basis on which the exit poll was conducted, as you were honest enough to acknowledge, David, was one which assumes an absolutely uniform national swing. And I suspect that what we may see tonight are some quirky results in individual parts of the country. I also believe, overall, that the strength of support for change and the enthusiasm with which so many people have flocked to the Conservative Party in the last few days of the campaign may mean that we're in a position to have a majority. I certainly think, on the basis of what we've seen so far, that there's been a, a rejection, as I say, of Gordon Brown and an embrace of the alternative arguments that have been put forward by David Cameron and my colleagues. Michael Gove, thank you very much. I'm joined here by Vince Cable, the Shadow Chancellor for the Liberal Democrats. This is a, a very strange exit poll for the Liberal Democrats, if it's true that you're three seats down from the last Parliament. Well, it's very strange, and, and as you've, you've issued all the, the right caveats, I mean, the, these polls have been horribly wrong in the past, notably 1992. The key thing this time is they don't include postal votes. Postal votes have been a very high percentage this time, and many of them were issued at the time when we were at the peak of our support in the polls. And it's, we're talking here about uniform swings, and as you know, our support tends to be very strong in some areas. And uh, we have no information on Lib Dem Labour, Lib Dem Tory marginals. All the sense I've got on the ground talking to my colleagues and my own experience is there is a fantastic mood of confidence amongst our you, people. You said the postal balloting was when you were at your peak. Did you sense a sort of decline, like some people said the wind was going out of the tyre? Well, you, you put it over dramatically, but I think there was a period when we were, I think, first in the polls, and that was when a lot of postal votes were cast. If, but if the, this the, is right, who, who do you think? Look, here are the first ballot boxes being opened in Sunderland, being rushed, being rushed into the count there. Pupils from local schools running, and they've practiced all this. They've actually weighed the paper to make sure they get paper that can be counted fast. Very briefly, Vince Cable, who would have the legitimacy in, in this setup if it well, does come out like nobody this? Nobody does. I mean, the Conservatives have fallen well short of an overall majority. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Let's have a look at the at the exit poll in a bit of detail, can we? Yes, David, let's visualise inside the House of Commons here and bring in the MPs, put them on the benches, government benches this side, and let's look at the winning marker over here. 650 MPs, of course, in order to get an overall majority, you need 326, just over half. And as you've been saying, we'll bring on the Conservatives' numbers now, but just from the exit poll, it does show them falling short, although easily the largest party on 307. So that is where the exit poll leaves us. Again, to visualise this, let's look at the opposition benches. Labour would move over this side of the House of Commons on this result from the exit poll, and they would have 255 seats. And then you can see the Liberal Democrats. Let's count them. 62 last time. 59 this time down a bit according to the exit poll the others welsh nationalists scottish nationalists maybe a green mp in there 29 seats so that is how the house of commons would look according to our exit poll according to our exit poll 
And let's just take a look at the battle the Conservatives faced in this election campaign and try and work out if they have fallen short how that has happened. Here we have the Conservative target battleground. 250 seats the Conservatives got their eyes on, ranging from the most vulnerable, the top left, which is Gillingham, just a 15-vote majority there. Crawley, 37 majority, going down. And as you go down the board and to the right, they get harder and harder for the Conservatives to win until at the bottom right, it's the least vulnerable to this Tory attack. We'll call this the Conservative attack battleground. Now, the Conservatives need 116 extra seats on their 2005 election result for an overall majority. And if they win them on an even advance, we can isolate the 116 that they would need to take. And over here would be the 116th, which is Waveney. All eyes on that one when it's declared later on. If they've fallen short, it could be a number of reasons. What might have happened is that the Lib Dems, who fought the campaign so well in their terms, may have been better protected in their seats, the orange seats on the list, than the Conservatives would have imagined five weeks ago. Or possibly, the Conservatives simply haven't reached down far enough in the list. They haven't taken the less vulnerable red seats, the Labour seats, towards the end of the list. But we stress again and again here, it is just the exit poll and it leaves the Conservatives very much on the cusp. David. Jeremy, thank you very much. Well, let's just uh, have a look at that in detail in a, in a moment. But first, let's join Sophie Rayworth, who's up in Houghton and Sunderland South. Sophie. 10.43, that is the time that they want to declare their first seat by tonight. And they are racing here to do just that. Van after van appearing here at Sunderland's tennis centre. They've got to get all these boxes in here by 10.15, 10.16 if they're going to do it. 41 vans with 41 ballot boxes all rushing in. And the way that they're doing it is by using all these students. They've got 90 students from the, from the local school, six formers who are throwing these uh, boxes down the line as they get them into the tennis centre. I'm just going to squeeze through here and take you inside and this is where it all is all happening. This is the point at which they, they check in the ballot boxes to make sure that they've got the right things and they're counting here tonight three different seats. Now everyone is really hard at work. They've got 233 counters counting away to make sure that they get these results by 10.43. That is the time they want to achieve that is the time that they will break their record whether they'll do it we'll see it should become an olympic sport i think anyway 10:43. we'll be watching out for that now let's get back to this exit poll and this possibility that there is a hung parliament on the scale that our exit poll suggested nick what would what would happen in your view then in the in, in the in the real political world well happily it's not just my view it has now been an enormous amount of work has been done behind the scenes david to get this clarified as to what the rules should be now i'm going to describe to you what the rules are rather than what the political reality may actually turn out to be the rules suggest this that the prime minister gordon brown is prime minister until he resigns in other words until the moment it is clear that he himself cannot command the confidence of the House of Commons by having a majority of all the MPs on those green benches. So in theory, even if Gordon Brown has lost, even if Labour has not got as many seats as the Tories, he could then turn to Nick Clegg and say, we would like to do a deal with the Liberal Democrats in order to try and form a stable government. And the Tories could do nothing about it. Absolutely. Stage. And you will note the words of Harriet Harman in your interview. She said it was a difficult time and the country needed stable government. I think she is preparing the way for that possibility. Now, if that couldn't happen, then what would happen if there were no deal open to Gordon Brown? Then Mr Cameron gets his go, either to form a deal himself with uh, the Liberal Democrats or minor parties, the Ulster Unionists, the DUP, or to have a minority government. What's, now, the, I what's the time limit? Sorry to interrupt you. What's the time limit that, that uh, Gordon Brown would have, to, if it went that way, to stitch up a deal with the Liberal Democrats? In theory, many days, 12 days until the Queen's speech. In reality, the pressure of the markets, the pressure from elsewhere. And what we might see, David, tonight is if it's uncertain as to who can do this, there will be an argument about who has legitimate the Tories on this sort of result say, hold on, we've won. Gordon Brown has to leave, he has to pack his bags. The Labour Party may be saying, hold on, you haven't got the confidence of the country as a whole. We need a stable government and we think we could form one. Good, well, there'll be plenty more of that as we get the results in, no doubt, and uh, speculation about what will happen. But let's find out 
Uh, who, what's happening with the party leaders now? Andrew Marr is at Whitney and he's going to be following David Cameron tonight. Andrew. Well, David, um, David Cameron has just been uh, closeted with his closest team, the people who've been with him on this extraordinary five-year journey in his constituency house in the middle of Oxfordshire. And their immediate reaction to that poll is this. First, it's a decisive rejection of the Labour government and Gordon Brown. In terms of <laughs> seats, this would, if it was true, represent the biggest swing since 1931. Uh, second, um, I'm tempted to say I agree with Nick, that's Nick Robinson. Uh, on these numbers, the Conservative leader <laughs> thinks he has enough to govern. Uh, he would do whatever he needed to do, note those words, to provide a stable government. But from their point of view, uh, it's obviously not what they would like most of all, which is an overall majority, but it would be enough to govern um, and they would do whatever they could do uh, to eject Labour and put in a Conservative minority government. Now, of course, it is very, very early days. Uh, this has been a strange election campaign for them, as well as for everybody else. Um, and there is, I'm sure, a certain amount of scepticism about this opinion poll. Andrew, thank you very much. Well, now, uh, let's join John Simpson, who's in Kakadi in Fife, with Gordon Brown. John. Well, Gordon Brown and, and, and his wife, uh, Sarah, and uh, several senior advisers are in the house behind us. Um, unlike the Conservatives, they, nobody's come out to give any sort of response to these figures, though you can bet that the, the, the whole household is crouched over the television watching this as it, as it happens. I suspect that in amongst the gloom, uh, there will be just a little bit of, of relief here because uh, the gloom is, is, is obvious, but they've kind of got used to the idea, I think, that they weren't going to win. Uh, I think they're just really relieved that some of those suggestions that the Liberal Democrats were going to be the second largest party and so on haven't come to anything. Now, of course, their opinion pollsters told them that, but inevitably, uh, politicians tend uh, not always to believe everything that their, their own opinion polls tell us, any more than I suspect we should necessarily believe uh, every detail of this, uh, of this particular exit poll. Thanks very much, John. Now, Kirsty Walk is in Sheffield with Nick Clegg. Kirsty. Yes, Nick Clegg and his wife are home alone behind us here. They're cooking uh, dinner together and obviously watching this program. And the interesting thing about this exit poll is, and of course it is a very big if, is that if the Liberal Democrat vote as, is, as says of the exit poll and they've lost seats, they'll still be in the position very possibly of being able perhaps to form a coalition with Labour. You heard what Harriet Harman said. The price will probably be voting reform. The price may be Gordon Brown's head. But we're hearing another story tonight here. A woman has just pulled up here, very angry, because a lot of people, queues of people, were turned away from the polling station at 10 o'clock, unable to vote, because one of the polling stations, at least one in Nick Clegg's own constituency, was not able to handle the number of voters wanting to place their votes. Kirsty, thank you very much. Well, now, just a reminder, in case you joined us late about this exit poll, it has no, it has a hung parliament, is predicted by it. It has uh, no party with an overall majority, in other words. The Conservatives are 19 short at 307. Labour are down 94 on the previous parliament at 255. And the Liberal Democrats are down three, according to the exit poll, at 59. Uh, to chew over this for the first time tonight, Jeremy Paxman. Thank you, David. Well, uh, I'm joined now by Lord Mandelson, the Labour strategist, uh, by Theresa May from the Conservative Party and Ed Davey from the Liberal Democrats. Um, Labour has been pretty decisively not chosen, if not outright rejected in this exit poll, if it's correct. You're not going to try to hang on to power, are you? Well, this has been a most unpredictable election throughout, and it looks as if it's heading for something of a cliffhanger of a result. I mean, if you had said to me six months ago that we would achieve a hung parliament as a result of this election, I would not have believed you. It's people, quite amazing. But people had the chance to vote for Gordon Brown to continue as Prime Minister, and they have not taken that chance, according to this exit poll. Well, rather a lot of people have actually chosen the opportunity to vote Labour, according to your... So you uh, might according try to your, to According to your exit poll. But I think what has happened is that after three terms in office, 
Of course, many people have turned away from the Labour Party. I'm asking you to they, look forward. But what they haven't done is to fly into the arms of David Cameron's Tories. So you might try to do a deal. Alan Johnson said tonight he's no problem with the deal. You might try to do a deal. Well, the constitutional conventions are very clear. You know the rules, and the rules are that if it's a hung parliament, so uh, it's, it's not the party with the largest number of seats that has first go. It's the sitting government. So you will try to form some sort of arrangement with the Liberal Democrats in order to hang on to power? Well, let's wait until we see the result and the exact... Do you have a problem with deals? Uh, I have no problem, in principle, uh, in trying to supply this country with a strong and stable government. Now, Theresa May, if this exit poll is correct, it's a disappointing night for you, isn't it? Well, first of all, gentlemen, I think it's an unwise politician who doesn't treat exit polls with a certain degree Fair of enough. caution. I think I, you know, that's yeah, been said okay, well, I'm asking you to talk on. about the but exit if it, poll. If it, is, if it is correct, I think what it does show is a clear rejection of Gordon Brown. And I think it shows that Labour would have lost their legitimacy to government because but, if those figures are correct, they'll have had the worst results since nineteen thirty. Fair enough for them to try to come to some sort of arrangement with the Liberal Democrats, isn't it? I think if... What, if those sort of figures that we've seen in that exit poll are correct, what they would have shown would be that the Labour Party would have lost more seats than in any other Absolutely, election but since is 1931. Not fair enough for them and to I try to come actually, to some sort of arrangement. No, I think that actually says the British people are giving a message of rejection of Gordon Brown. But not so, overly keen on David Cameron and the Conservatives. But you're losing your legitimacy to govern if you see that sort of rejection. You, I mean, don't, losing you don't seem to be on a that sort of, it, though, on that sort of uh, on that sort <laughs> of poll. Seems to be a problem with your um, legitimacy as well. Well, I think, Peter, if you looked, actually, we had rather more seats than Labour on that exit poll. So of that suggests a rather greater acceptance of, of the Conservative but message than more, it does of the, but a rather the, more than balanced, does of the Labour Party's message. A rather more message. balanced and nuanced result, I think, than the one that you're losing describing. Losing biggest loss of seats since 1931, balanced and nuanced. Rather more nuanced. I rather think not. Uh, Ed, Dave, you are going to say that this exit poll, no doubt, can't be right, are you? Well, if we look at your, the BBC's record on exit polls, in 1992 you were over 60 seats out. All right. And um, this certainly doesn't uh, bear so, a witness to those polls that we well, saw we'll, in the campaign we'll, we'll or, know our, by or our canvassing. We'll know by so, the end of the night. So you're absolutely but, right, Jeremy. I completely agree with you. We don't I, think this exit poll I, really should, I was really should speculating really bear the weight that other seats are putting on it. But, but let's deal with Peter Mandelson's point. Would the Liberal Democrats be prepared to come to some sort of accommodation with the Labour Party, led by Gordon Brown, so that the uh, Conservatives are kept out of government? We're not going to speculate on that. Um, what uh, Nick Clegg made very clear during the campaign was... It's a matter was, of principle, it, surely. It, it, we, we want to wait and see what the results are. That's what Nick Clegg made very clear. Mm. The voters are the kingmakers. We're speculating sure. without one single vote having been count, counted, and we were one seat being declared. Now, come on, Jeremy. But you might consider getting into bed with Peter Mendelssohn. What we want, in, if there is a balanced parliament, is to make sure that financial stability is, a, is the bedrock of okay. the government that emerges. We have to All make right. sure we don't play fast and loose There's with the British economy. Well. He's not British ruled people. it out very quickly. There has to be electoral reform as a result of this vote, because I think first past the post is really on its last legs. Well, we'll see. We're only talking about an exit poll at this point. Of we'll course. see how, how the On the basis out. of the, ele of the okay, exit fair poll, enough, I'm fair David. Thank you, Jeremy. There's just one interesting quote from Nick Clegg uh, on the Andrew Marr. I said it to Andrew Marr just over a week ago. I think a party which has got the most votes and seats, which in other words has got the strongest mandate, but without an absolute majority, has got the right to seek to form the government. In words that he spoke, he said a number of things, but those seem pertinent tonight. I don't know whether they'll stick with that, but we'll see. Uh, we, I come Please, back. Yes, Nick, very briefly. briefly. To seek to form a government. Very important, careful yes. choice of words. Yes. Nick Clegg is simply saying that the largest party could try, but if they couldn't form a stable government, then someone else would have a go. But Peter Mandelson's writing the script for it as we speak, saying the basis of it is electoral reform and stability in the face of an economic But he's not crisis. saying Gordon Brown has to go. Uh, on the basis of this. He's not saying it has to go very carefully chosen words that David Cameron, on the basis of our exit poll, Nick Clegg is saying, would have first go. Okay. But if he failed, 
then they could reconsider a Emily deal with Gordon Ramsay. your chance to have first go. <laughs> yeah, just to remind you that the big picture of the night will emerge from these hundreds of individual races that are going on. My team's analysing what's actually happening at the count alongside YouGov's Peter Kellner to look and see what the first trends of the night are. That could really point us in the right direction. So if I take you to a few of those early declarers, you saw the mad running with the boxes in Sunderland. There's a cluster of seats. Uh, Sunderland Central is one of them. This is staunchly Labour territory traditionally, and it needs some big swings to see this move away from Labour. But this seat is one that David Cameron has said is his wild card. Now, if they can take this, it will be a major upset for Labour. Even if they can't, we'll be looking to see what happens to the Conservative share of the vote here. Any improvement might pave the way for success in places where the battles are closer. Places, for example, like Carlisle, Cumbria. Now, here, the Labour vote took a big hit a couple of elections ago over foot and mouth. And here is somewhere that the Conservatives really have to start pushing into to prove they understand the working class concerns of the North. Peter. Yes, uh, Emily. Carlisle is the sort of seat the Conservatives really need to take if they're to get close to 326 seats. They need a 7% swing. Now, one of the interesting things in our exit poll is that it finds that the swing to the Conservatives is almost twice as high where Labour has a new candidate as where Labour has a sitting MP. And in Carlisle, it's a new candidate. Very so on the exit poll, the Conservatives might be in with a chance there. And bearing that in mind, then, if I take us to uh, Birmingham Edgebaston, you'll remember this as one of the first televised victories for Tony Blair in 1997, this leafy suburb of Birmingham, bringing a very popular MP, Gisela Stewart, to power. Look how tight this race is here, less than a 2% swing needed here. If the Conservatives don't take this seat, it will have been a disastrous night for them, Peter. But this is where there is a sitting MP uh, uh, and if the Conservatives don't take this comfortably they're in trouble. But it might not be such a big swing because Labour does have a sitting MP. Peter, thanks very much. We'll be looking closely at the results from those first seats when they emerge in the next few minutes. David. Thanks, Emily. Well, let's um, leave our glamorous BBC election studio and join an even more glamorous site on the Thames, where Andrew Neil, who's been throughout this election conducting debates with all the politicians, had nine debates, I think, whereas some of us only got one. Anyway, Andrew's down there on the Thames. Andrew. Yes, we're in the heart of London, on the banks of the Thames, under the London Eye, just across the river from the Houses of Parliament. And I'm joined by three of our guests here at our event tonight, Piers Morgan, Jane Moore and Clive Anderson. Piers, you said to me for months and months and months, don't underestimate Gordon Brown. Guess you overestimated him. No, it's not over yet. I mean, I don't actually believe this exit poll. I cannot believe that Liberal Democrats have gone down. So I think the three-party situation we've seen developing the last few weeks has now led to a skewed exit poll. I just can't accept that that's true. But even if the exit poll is not entirely accurate, and I accept it is only an exit poll, it does look like the Tories are the clear leaders without an overall majority but way ahead of anybody else it does and if you ask me what i honestly think i think i picked up the front page of one of the papers today it's yours actually jane calling david cameron the new obama uh, i don't think he's a new obama and i think we're being yes. sold a pup here by a media uh, collaboration designed to make us think this is the the great new future this country by the end of next week i suspect will be facing one of the great financial crises we've had in a very long time. And we are about to, if these polls are right, turf out Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling, two of the most experienced financial po politicians we've had in decades. It's a crazy situation. Well, there's a financial crisis underway in New York right now. Right now. And it may hit us in London tomorrow. Indeed, the markets are opening at one o'clock this morning. We'll see what happens there. Uh, Jane Moore, your paper and yourself, did you come out for Cameron because you wanted Mr. Cameron or because you wanted rid of Mr. Brown? Uh, a little bit of both, I think. Um, I, I think that uh, I don't think Gordon Brown is a bad man. I just think he's not been a great prime minister, and I think he's completely lumbered by 13, the past 13 years of his own record and that of New Labour. And Nick Clegg, the longer that uh, the longer that he went on after the first leaders' debate, uh, the more it became obvious that you think his the Lib Dems are Peter Gart? Uh, yeah, I think he's, he was flip-flopping on policy, he was repeating himself. I don't think he bore much scrutiny. They've not really prepared for government because they weren't expecting to have that bounce. The most surprising thing about this exit poll is 
the Lib Dems getting only 59. Losing seats, I mean, we began today thinking they may get 100. Now, they may still, because it's just a poll. It'd look a bit weird, but, isn't it? But have get, we yeah. seen, have we been witnessing the rise and fall of the Lib Dems in one act? Well, I suppose in the third leadership uh, debate, it was a bit odd when he was denying the euro. It was like the, the, the cock crowing behind him as he denied it. But perhaps Pierre should have been in charge of all the leadership debates. And, <laughs> and he could have asked all of them where, where they proposed to their wives <laughs> and, uh, and whether they joined the Mile High Club. But we'd have had a more perceptive uh, you, view of the, of the leaders. Yeah. Yeah. You mean getting to the heart of policy? Yes, exactly. Yeah. What should Gordon Brown do now? Uh, wait, because I think it's going to be a very long night. I don't accept this exit poll. I think that Gordon <laughs> Brown may be pleasantly surprised. We're going to get a hung parliament at the moment. Is that good for David Cameron? Is it good for the country? I'm not sure it's good for either of them. You know, this financial situation developing is arguably a bigger story than what's happening with our politics right now. And whoever inherits this mess has got to fix it very quickly. So we're, right. just, we're just fiddling around while Greece burns, aren't we? Uh, right. It's not going to burn in this temperature, let no. me tell you. It's pretty <laughs> cold. Oh, I'm going to leave you here. I'm going indoors. Enjoy well, yourself. You. Now, if you're going to have a major election night event, this is where you want to have it here in the heart of London, surrounded, surrounded. by historic buildings, reminiscent resonant of our democracy. But come on inside with me because this is where the party is going on. It's a little warmer in here too. Let's just walk downstairs and see who we have. We have Bruce Forsyth and Ben Kingsley. Hello. Welcome to both of you. Let me Thank start you. with you, Ben. Were you energized by this campaign? I, I'm very energized by it. it it's, a, it's a rather somber day, at the same time a very exciting day. And it's a huge celebration of democracy. When you think of when South Africans were first allowed to vote, and you saw those touching queues, lines and lines of thousands of people who'd been there for days waiting to vote. It's so beautiful. Uh, the whole process is so uplifting, really. And it looks like the turnout was high. We don't know for Good. sure, but it looks like I'm getting reports I around think the will. country. I think it high will. High turnout. Be. That's encouraging. It is very encouraging. But I must say, Andrew, I feel very uncomfortable because I never have my back to an audience. <laughs> There's my audience. Quiet, please. Quiet. Nice to see you, to see you. I never had my back to the audience, you see. Sorry about that. What do you think of the exit poll? I thought it was, well, I thought it was, as you said, high. I think it's, anything could happen. That's yeah. the, I, I, you sure you didn't write this plot, Andrew? No, I did not. Because it, it looks, looks like it's not a great night for Mr. Brown, so far. Well, I'll tell you three things I did this morning. And one thing I did not do, I'm so sorry, I did not vote strategically. I did vote with my head and I did vote with my heart. And you did a fourth thing. You came to our event I tonight. Did a fourth thing, which is probably the crown of the evening. To see you. As Thank you can see, the party's just getting underway. We'll be talking to you again soon. But for now, back to you. Thanks, Andrew. Well, at Houghton and Sunderland South, at the count there, they're wildly counting, trying to beat their record or hit 1043. They're saying now it's going to be a few minutes after that. The reason they're saying is because though they've been to all this trouble to measure the boxes and measure the weight of the ballot papers, they're fuller than they thought. In other words, there has been a higher turnout than they thought, and that may be why they're a bit delayed. Anyway, uh, we're now just after half past ten. Let's have a summary of how things stand, not just here, but in the world at large, from Fiona Bruce. Fiona. Yes, indeed. Well, the polls closed half an hour ago, and we now have our first indication of what the result of the election might be. The exit poll compiled for the BBC, for Sky and for ITV News by NOP Mori is predicting that we will have the first hung parliament since 1974. So, no party would have overall control. It suggests the Conservatives would have the most seats, 307, but that would leave them 19 seats short of an outright majority. Labour would have 255 seats, the Liberal Democrats would be in third place with 59, other parties with 29. Now the figures are based on a sample of people from across the country who were asked how they voted today when they left their polling station. Of course, all polls have a margin of error which could well be significant in such a tight election. We'll get a clearer picture, of course, as the actual results start coming in. And long queues to vote have been reported across the country even as the 10 o'clock deadline approached. This was a scene in Leeds where people were still queuing to vote at half past nine this evening. There are reports uh, that hundreds of people have been turned away at a count in Manchester without being able to vote. The former UK Independence Party leader is recovering from a plane crash. Nigel Farage was a passenger in a light aircraft which 
plummeted to the ground shortly after taking off from an airfield near Brackley in Northamptonshire. Mr Farage is being treated in hospital for broken ribs and other minor injuries. He's standing for the seat of Buckingham tonight, so you may have to hear the result from his hospital bed. Now, how the city reacts to the election result will be crucial to Britain's economic recovery. In an unprecedented move, the bond markets will open at 1 a.m. to allow traders the chance to respond quickly to the results as they come in. A short while ago, one financial analyst gave an early reaction to tonight's exit poll. The past week or so, market has had terrific problems, but has been accepting the fact that there is likely to have been a hung parliament. So if the exit poll is right, the market has factored that in. Really, the city has been looking for stability, which I think is very important. If the Conservatives can form a government and a viable government, then the answer is that is reasonable for the market. Well, across the world, the markets have been volatile. In New York, the Dow Jones has had a turbulent day. It lost almost a thousand points, something not seen since the height of the banking crisis two years ago. It closed down 347 points. Here in the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 80 points, almost 2%, and its fifth consecutive day of losses. And the FTSE 250 also lost ground. Now, concern about the economic crisis in Greece and fears that it could spread to other EU countries has driven the turbulence on the markets. Fighting has again broken out between protesters and riot police in the Greek capital Athens this evening. The violence began after Greece's parliament voted decisively in favour of drastic spending cuts. And incidentally, as well as following us live here in the studio, you can also check every detail and follow live updates from your constituency right through to the final result online. That's at bbc.co.uk slash election. So, just to recap, according to tonight's exit poll, it looks as if we are heading for a hung parliament with the Conservatives as the largest party. Thanks, Fiona. Let's join Jeremy. David, thank you. Well, uh, I'm joined now from Hull, I believe, by Alan Johnson. Alan Johnson, can you hear me? I can. can. Excellent, good. Um, now, uh, what do you think? Do you think you ought to think about conceding at this point? No, not at all. No, not on the back of an exit poll. That shows, first of all, that the Conservatives' big society has kind of gone nowhere. But no. Big flop. Um, if that exit poll is right, and suggests rather surprisingly that Lib Dems have fewer seats than now, um, so let's wait to see how this pans out. But it's hung parliament territory, it's not conceding defeat territory. So if it's hung parliament territory, you have no Hello? problem with a deal. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Alan Johnson? We obviously got to, communi we've got to communicate. You are back again, are you? No, we've got a communication problem. I never went away, Jeremy. I'm <laughs> if it is... <laughs> You can hear me then. So now, listen, if we are in hung parliament, excellent. If you're in hung parliament territory, you have no problem with trying to form some sort of deal with the Liberal Democrats. I have no problem at all. Indeed, if the outcome of this election, if the will of the people is that no party has an overall majority, that's where grown up, mature politicians have to be. Uh, I can't see the Lib Dems forming a deal with the Conservatives. I certainly can't see us forming a deal with the Conservatives, given that on the central issue of how we secure the recovery, we have so much in common. And given that on electoral reform, we have so much in common. And I'd be delighted to put before the British people a PR, AV Plus deal as well. And I think that really is uh, the, the, the proper area to talk about. Yeah, I think we've got a lot in common and we could come together on this. Let's see what the outcome is. But, you know, it's, it's been an intriguing, fascinating election and it's still got a few more twists and turns. But on, but on that basis, we would rewrite the results of half the elections in the last 30 or 40 years, wouldn't we? Why? Uh, well, uh, look, look, the simple fact is no party has got an overall majority. Logic, We're told hang on a second. By, by your logic, it was an anti-Labour majority in 2005. No, no, well, you're talking about a proportion of the vote. We don't know that yet. We know about seats. First past the post depends on seats. And we're told that the virtue, the single biggest virtue of first past the post is it delivers strong governments. I mean, the fact that it disenfranchises people and it's a miserably disempowering system, we're supposed to put up with that because it gives a strong government. Well, it hasn't. It hasn't. And I think, you know, there is a real will amongst the British people to say, let us decide, give us a say in our electoral system. They've never had a say in it. Unlike voters in Ireland and France and Germany, 
British electorate have never had a say in the system by which they transfer their vote to political power. And it's time to do that. OK, Alan Johnson, thanks very much indeed. Well, um, Theresa May, Peter Mandelson and Ed Davey are still with us. Who's won this election then? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I, I mean, without wishing to sound glib, the public seem to have won the election. I mean, they seem to have given You're us... You're wishing not to sound glib. <laughs> well, I didn't want to sound glib. But, I mean, the public have given, on the basis of the exit poll, and let's just mm. enter that yeah, caveat, sure. okay, please, it's just all the time, poll. because we haven't had one single result from a, an actual constituency. Okay. They have given a result, they've given an, an outcome, rather, on the basis of the exit poll, which says uh, we don't want uh, uh, a pure Labour government. Obviously, they feel that we've had a good innings, but they also seem to be having profound misgivings about a Tory-only government as well. Ed Davey, this raises uh, very interesting questions for you because Nick Clegg has said whichever party ha gets the largest number of seats has the right to try. Indeed, he endorsed that view. Yes, he, the he right said that. to try he, to form a government if they've got the largest number of seats. Well, he talked about the mandate in terms of seats and votes. We haven't had anything about the vote share yet. But clearly, if, if a party has the largest number of seats and the largest number of votes, um, the, the convention, I'd have thought, would be that they have the right to try to form a government. Nick's been clear about that throughout the campaign. Theresa May, who do you think's won? Don't say the public. <laughs> don't be glib. <laughs> Fancy that, Lord Mandelson saying don't be glib. I... All the caveats about the uh, about the exit poll, I, but I think what we see from this vote, if that is going the correct, if that's the way things are going, is a clear vote for change, a positive vote for change from the British people, um, and that's why I think they, what we're seeing in that uh, exit poll is a vote that Conservatives coming out potentially with the largest number of seats because it's the one party that has actually really put forward a, a mandate for change and showing how we would actually change the That's way this country true, is governed. You guys try and hang on to Downing Street, it's going to look like a coup, isn't it? I don't think so, no. Look, I, I think the answer, the explanation for this lies in the YouGov tracking question about attitudes to a Conservative um, government. Throughout the entire campaign, uh, never more than 25% have said they would be delighted at the prospect of a Conservative government. And never fewer than 35% uh, have said that they're anything other than dismayed at the prospect of a Conservative government. And I think what you're seeing is, yes, you know, people are voting for change, but they're not absolutely sure what change it is that they want, and they're certainly not sure they want to change uh, to a Conservative government uh, governing alone. How are you going to play this now? Should this... I'm uh, sorry, I'm being told I've got to hand back to you. David. Oh, Jeremy, that's nice of you. I don't know why you had to hand back in such a hurry, but anyway. Interesting to hear Lord Mandelson saying that the public have said they don't want a pure Labour government, whatever a pure Labour government is. Anyway, we're waiting for Houghton and Sunderland South. Now, it's going to be a bit slower than we thought. It should be 10.49 that we get it. It's 10.42 now, so there are a few minutes to go. And remember, We've got just this exit poll that we've all been talking about since we went on air nearly an hour ago. Uh, Sophie, do you think uh, we're going to get 10.49? Is that going to be about right? Because it will give us the first idea of whether there's any reality to the exit poll, even the scant information that comes from Houghton. I think they're hoping to do it faster if they can. They're all gathering there, the candidates. Right, well, they're, they're gathering there. Anyway, we will go back there at the moment uh, as soon as we can. Um, let's just have a look at the concept of the swing and the swingometer, the number of people who've switched their views since the last election and how this affects the outcome, Jeremy. Can we do that? First of all, here's a map of the UK as it was coloured in in the 2005 general election, and we'll recolour it, obviously, as we get all those results in. We'll take a look at the swingometer. It's basically a very simple device that shows the effect of voters switching sides since the last general election. We have a Lib Dem swingometer for you very shortly, but the principle is this. If you have 100 voters and five of them go from Labour to the Conservative, that is a 5% swing uh, from Labour to the Conservative. So let's have, a, let's have a look at our swingometer here, and you can see the seats, the blue seats, Conservative seats coloured in in 2005 at the last general election. And then on the other side, the red seats, Labour seats won last time as well. And at the central pivot, you see a 0% swing would simply leave them all in the same position. 
Now the exit poll suggests that the swing to the Conservatives nationally is five and a half percent. So you can see them taking, under the exit poll, we obviously have to add that caveat, seats like Gedling and Lincoln and Dewsbury and so on, but not quite as many as they need for the overall majority. They need about seven percent nationally for an overall majority. If we just take a look at these seats in England, I'll just isolate the English seats on the swingometer. Something very interesting that's coming out of the exit poll is this, that the swing to the Conservatives in England is higher. It's about 7%. Now bear in mind they did very well in England in the 2005 general election. To swing a further 7% takes some doing. But further to that, the exit poll is suggesting there may have been a swing to Labour in Wales and Scotland. Just a small swing against the Conservatives of 1%. So that may be part of this result as well. I promised a Liberal Democrat swingometer. Let us take a look at the Lib Dem swingometer here and see what it tells us about the battle with the Conservatives. Because, of course, part of the story of the campaign was the surge, the so-called surge for the Lib Dems that happened after the television debate, and then the question about whether Nick Clegg might fight off the Conservatives successfully in lots of seats. Well, the, the, the surge has ended up like this, according to our exit poll. Lib Dem Conservative battles, just a small swing to the Conservatives of 2%. So maybe the Liberal Democrats effectively blocking the Conservatives in some of the seats they wanted to take. Bit too early to be certain of that. It all comes from the exit poll. It's fascinating. David. Jeremy, thanks very much. Uh, there are 13 Tory targets in London, seats which if they were to make that 116 gain, give them 326, uh, they would need to have. Now, Martha Carney is in Wandsworth tonight, and there's one of the seats there. Martha. Hi, David. Well, we don't have any schoolboy athletes running in with the ballot boxes, but counting is firmly underway in this area, which has received a huge amount of political attention. It was just down the road at Battersea Power Station, where David Cameron launched his campaign. And I think in these seats here, we'll get a very good indication of how the party is doing nationally. First of all, there's a seat of Battersea, which Labour only held on to by a whisker in 2005, by 163 votes. The Conservatives hope it'll be their first gain from Labour of the night, we hope to bring you that result at half past 12. Much more of a challenge will be tooting. Now, it's here that the Conservatives say they hope to decapitate a Labour minister, obviously not literally. That's Sadiq Khan, the Transport Minister, who also sits in Cabinet. The Conservatives have a challenger there, a candidate who describes himself as one of the new breed. He's, he was uh, born in a council estate, and he is somebody who very much sees himself as being a very different kind of Conservative. But they'll need to take that seat. They need a swing of 6.1%, which is the kind of area that they're looking at if they want to gain power nationally. And then finally, Putney, rising star in the party, Justine Greening. One of the big moments of 2005 was when she won, so she certainly hopes she will hang on to it. So it should be a fascinating night here in Wandsworth. Martha, thank you very much. Well, now, Torbay in the West Country is a seat that's held by the Liberal Democrats, and the result there may give us our first indication, because it's a fairly early declarer, of uh, how the Liberal Democrats have done, whether things have gone as badly as the exit polls suggest. Anyway, Zena Badawi is there tonight. Zena. Yes, well, David, this is a key test of just how strong the Liberal Democrat vote is after that Clegg, Clegg surge, and also just um, whether the Conservatives are going to win this seat, because they, it really is a very marginal Liberal Democrat seat here in the South West, and the count is underway. All the ballot boxes are in, a very sedate affair compared to what was going on in Sunderland. Now, the incumbent, Adrian Sanders, has held this seat for the last 13 years, since 1997. His majority is about 2,700, which means the Conservatives could win it if there was a swing of 3%. And Marcus Wood, their um, candidate, I'm told that they are quietly confident. And so this would actually uh, be very, very significant if the Conservatives do manage to wrench this away from the Lib Dems. Zainab, thanks very much. You have an idea, by the way, when we'll get that? You say around midnight or after? Well, we were hoping it would be about midnight 30, but actually I'm told that it could be more like 1, 1 1.30, possibly as late as 2 a.m. So a bit of a wait. Thanks very much, Zainab. There is a delay in a lot of these counts. It's partly postal ballots that have to be opened and verified, signatures verified, and there's, last time there were about 15% of the electorate voted postally. This time it's thought to be rather more than that. 
but also a lot of these places also have council, local council elections, so the ballot papers have actually got to be separated before they can start that business of counting. Anyway, what do you, what do you think we should be looking for in Sunderland? Well, we're going to look not for the final outcome in Sunderland, because we're pretty sure it will be a Labour victory, but it will give us a sense of whether our exit poll is right. It'll be interesting on turnout as well, because when we're hearing that some of these counts are being delayed, David, it is further confirmation that there are a large number of people who've voted, including many people, it seems, who've not been able to vote. We're getting reports from Sheffield, as we heard in our news bulletin, of people queuing to vote and having the doors slammed in their it's face. to call it? quite without precedent, in my knowledge at least. I'm seeing reports in Manchester as well of people in large numbers, I don't mean two or three, but a couple of hundred in Manchester, Withington I believe, who wanted to vote and couldn't, who've arrived late, got in yes. the queue and not got through the door. Now of course, if there are close results, this opens the possibility of legal challenge to this. The returning officers will no doubt say this is absolutely the letter of the law, is that they close the doors on the yeah. dot at 10 o'clock. But, but you uh, remember, in, uh, they were talking earlier on about South African elections. When they had the first election in South Africa, they kept the polling for another day or two in order that everybody who wanted to vote should. That's right. And at a How time... How can it be that they can't get everybody through? I don't understand. It can only be that many, many more people have decided to vote late than anyone expected and that that has just taken them by surprise. They've not been ready for it. Sophie, how's the race going? 10.50 now. In, I think it looks like we could be almost there. They're way off their target, though. They wanted to declare by 10.43, and uh, they're almost uh, closing in on 10 minutes over that. I've been talking to the Labour candidate there, Bridget Phillips, and if she wins, she is going to become possibly the second youngest MP. She's only 26 years old. She says she is very nervous. Here they all come. I'm not sure she has any reason to be. Be disappointed. We'll be highly relieved to have one result in Houghton and Sunderland South. Labour majority of 17,000 last time. I'm ready to declare the result of Houghton and Sunderland South. I, Dave Smith, Acting Returning Officer, hereby give notice that the total number of votes for each candidate for the Houghton and Sunderland South constituency is as follows. Karen Allen, British National Party, 1,961. Christopher Peter Boyle, Liberal Democrats, 5,292. Richard Peter Elvin, UK Independence Party, 1,022. Robert Geoffrey Oliver, Conservative Party candidate, 8,147. Bridget Phillipson, the Labour Party candidate, 19,000. Colin Wakefield, Independent, 2,462. And that Bridget Phillipson has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. So Bridget Phillipson, 26 year old, formerly at Oxford. Chair of the Labour Club there, manages a woman's refuge, is the first elected MP for the new parliament. Here are the figures, like and we'll have a look at the share and the change in a moment. But there are the raw figures. Labour on 19,137. She's down just over 10% from last time. Robert Oliver, 8,147. He's up by about 5%. We'll see the figures exactly then. The Liberal Democrats in third place, and Colin Wakefield in fourth place and the others replacing Fraser Kemp and Chris Mullen. That's how they break up. An the BNP in green there, 1961. So let's just see the share of the vote. And, every one of you and some of these constituencies, most of them, of these shares are based of course on today, but they when we compare them, we're comparing them not with two thousand and five, because so many of the boundaries have changed, some of them radically, 
We are comparing them with what's called the notional result in 2005, i.e. what the figures would have been had the election been fought on these boundaries back in 2005. There's the share, and here's the change since last time. Labour down 12 percentage points, Conservatives up 5, Liberal Democrats down 1 percentage point, disappointing for them, Independents up 7, the BNP down 2, and it's a swing from Labour to the Conservatives, 8.4%. So let's have a look at that in some detail, can we, Emily? Yeah, let's break this down, going into Houghton uh, for you. And as you've seen there, what has happened is that Conservative share of the vote has inched up, so more recognition for the Conservatives there. The Lib Dems, interestingly enough, slipping there. I'm not sure that they would have expected that. And although the Labour vote down that 12%, They've still got this huge majority. It started off as a 23% swing to take this Conservative. That was never really going to happen, Peter. Emily, you're right. The Conservatives were never going to win this. This swing is certainly consistent with the exit poll. If anything, it's slightly bigger than one would have expected. Although Halton uh, and Sutherland South does have a new Labour candidate. As you were saying earlier, the swing does seem to be higher where Labour has a new candidate in Labour-held seats. The Liberal Democrats down one point. That's certainly consistent with the exit poll, which is finding nationally they're not much different. However, I would say two things. Firstly, turnout is only up about two percentage points. We think it's up quite a lot more in the really seriously contested seats. Yeah, turn out 55%, just up 2%. I mean, this is, this is yeah. relatively low. I mean, it, in the country, this is a pretty low turnout. It, it's low, and I think the turnout will be up more in the really contested seats. And as a result of the higher turnout, the swings may be different. But so far, there's nothing here which says our exit poll is wildly wrong. Peter, thanks very much. A certain triumph to get it the first result. And, of course, you can follow your own constituency on the website, bbc.co.uk slash election, to find out what's going on where you are or, indeed, the national picture as it emerges. David. Thanks very much, Emily. Uh, we'll, we'll be reporting not just from uh, with the party leaders and all that. We'll also be looking at regions of the country. We'll be looking at the different nations. We'll be paying particular attention to them. And we'll be looking at Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland could be very important. Uh, if it's very close thing because of the number of MPs who may be returned from Northern Ireland who will support or might be minded to support a Conservative administration. Mark Simpson is there. Mark, good evening and can you give us any indication, first of all, when we're going to get results from you in Northern Ireland and secondly, what the mood of the voters is? I'd be surprised, David, if we get any results before midnight. I can tell you, though, that the Democratic Unionist Party in Paisley's old party, now led by Peter Robinson, is very excited by the exit poll. It, of course, got nine seats last time. Nine seats could be very handy for a would-be Prime Minister tomorrow. And already a senior member of the Democratic Unionist Party, Arlene Foster, when quizzed on BBC Northern Ireland about what would happen if, uh, if you get to Westminster next week and you bump into David Cameron, well, she said... Uh, we'll not be running to David Cameron, he'll be coming to us. And another senior member of the party that I spoke to off the record said, Westminster's difficulty is Ulster's opportunity. So unionists here getting very excited. The one last thing, of course, David Cameron's easiest way to win seats is Northern Ireland is for his partnership with Sir Ed Jampy's Ulster unionists to produce some seats. Well, at best they can hope for four, but there's actually at this stage no guarantee that they're going to get any. Well, just wait and just see, as I say, sometime after midnight. Yes, Mark, just very briefly, what kind, of, what kind of deal would they be looking for? More money for Northern Ireland? What would it be? <laughs> Uh, the quote I was given was, first and foremost, finance, the three Fs. It's going to be protection of the finance that I Northern see. Ireland gets, that multi-billion pound block grant, and, and some other sweeties for those at Stormont as well. So that would be uh, at the expense of the rest of the United Kingdom, of course, if it happened. Well, they will be arguing that Northern Ireland has special circumstances because of the troubles and everything, yep. but of, as we know, all politics is local, and Peter Robinson would be saying to a would-be Prime Minister, if you want us, you're going to have to pay a pretty high price, and George Osborne, or whoever it is, is going to have to dig pretty deep into his pocket. Well, everybody thinks they're a special case. Let's go down to Wales and join Sean Lloyd, who's there. Sean, good evening, and can you give us again the, an idea of how things are going, what the issues are, and when you expect results to come through? 
Good evening to you. We don't expect any results here either before midnight. I mean, the earliest uh, results that we expect are up in the north, perhaps the Vale of Cloyd around uh, one o'clock in the morning and Anis Morn also at one o'clock in the morning. And actually those two seats will be seats that we will be watching uh, very, very carefully because the uh, Vale of Cloyd is uh, one of the top targets for the Conservative Party here in Wales. And wa Wales has uh, traditionally been Labour. However, uh, it had 29 seats last time round in 2005 out of the 40 constituencies being contested here in Wales. However, in the 2007 Assembly elections, the local elections the following year, and then the European elections last year, the Labour vote has slid. They've had a hammering here, and they're going to look to see if they can stop that slide. However, the Conservatives really feel that they really feel that they can make gains here. The Vale of Glamorgan and Cardiff North, Cardiff North, which is being counted in the building where I am tonight, top target seats for them, only a 2% swing required for them to take those from Labour. And also seats in the northeast of the country, the Vale of Cluid, Cluid South and Delin, a uh, higher swing required here. But these seats were blue in the 80s and they're the type of seats that David Cameron is going to have to take if he is going to be in power. Sean, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to Edinburgh now uh, and join Alan Little, 59 seats in Scotland. And what do you think they'll be looking out for tonight in Scotland when they see this exit poll and speculate on whether there's going to be a hung parliament, Alan? Well, Labour's defending 41 of those seats, and it looks like from the Labour point of view, Fortress Scotland has held up very well for, for them, uh, resisting the onslaught both from the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish National Party, who is the main ch which is the main challenger to Labour here, uh, and certainly from the Conservative Party. There are a few interesting marginals. One being counted below me, Edinburgh South, where the Labour Party are defending a majority of just a few hundred. I think the Liberal Democrats uh, have long been confident of taking that, possibly Edinburgh North and Leith as well. But the interesting question is where this leaves the Scottish National Party, who will still be in government tomorrow morning in Scotland, regardless who wins in Westminster. Alex Salmond went into this election saying that he wanted to win 20 seats. That would have been nearly double the maximum they've ever held in the past in their history. That turned out to be a bit of a hostage to fortune. They have an enormously steep mountain to climb. By the time you look at their third target seat of Kilmarnock, they're asking for a swing of 10% or more. So it looks as though uh, they will be under pressure in some of their existing seats. Uh, they want to take a couple of seats in central uh, uh, Scotland. But if they had if they had had 20 seats, that would have put them in a very strong position if this exit poll were correct. But it doesn't look like it's going to work out for them. Alan, thank you very much indeed. You may have noticed at the top of the screen, 326 to win. That's an overall majority in the new House of Commons. And the three colours, Labour in red, of course, with the one seat from Houghton and Sunderland South. Let's rejoin Jeremy Paxman. Well, we're joined now by Douglas Alexander, who played a key role in the Labour campaign and is very close to the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. Uh, Douglas Alexander, if these uh, figures in the exit poll are borne out in reality, you're not really going to try to cling on to power, are you? Well, it's very early in the evening. Let's wait and see whether the numbers that the BBC are projecting turn out to be the people's votes cast in individual constituencies. But it is clear that you need to command a majority in the House of Commons, so let's wait and see which party is able to secure that majority in the House of Commons. But this is potentially a worse result for you than at any time since the 1980s, 1983 for example. Well, let's wait and see. It's always going to be tough securing a fourth-term Labour government. I think we've only had two fourth-term governments in 200 years in the United Kingdom. And if the numbers are borne out, and that's a big if, we'll lose some very valuable colleagues this evening. But if we've learned anything in this most unpredictable of elections, it's to take our time and not to presume ahead of events. So let's just wait and see how the individual seats play themselves out. My sense is there may be less regional variation than people was expecting but more variation between the seats than anybody anticipated. So it's going to come down to individual races and individual communities. Let's we'll wait and see how it turns yeah, out. Indeed, we will, we will see. But if you do not get a majority of the votes, the people have clearly, decisively rejected Gordon Brown. You can't have him hanging on in number 10 as some sort of squatter, can you? Let's wait and see what the results are. I mean, I'm conscious that the Conservatives were, what, 22 points ahead of Labour in the opinion polls just a few months ago. Even before this election was called, the expectation was the Conservatives would secure a clear majority if your exit poll is right. 
then actually what we've seen in the course of the campaign is support falling for the Conservatives. Of course I'm not satisfied with the projected number of Labour seats, but ultimately let's wait and see where we are in a few hours' time. But you're not willing to concede even if you don't get the most seats? Well, ultimately you need to be able to command a majority in the House of Commons and it will be for us to decide, along with every other party, what is the best way forward if these results play themselves out. I have a sense that even if the Conservatives don't get across the winning line, of course Conservatives supporting newspapers and commentators will be keen to give them the result anyway. But under the British Constitution, you need to secure that majority in the House of Commons. And let's therefore see where we are in a few hours' time. OK, let's see. Theresa May, what do you make of that sort of talk? Well, I find it absolutely extraordinary. If that exit poll turns out to be correct, and in fact what we've just seen from the Houghton and Sunderland result was that actually it was a bigger swing to the Conservatives than the exit poll was suggesting. But if these figures are the sort of figures that are going to come out tonight, there's a clear rejection of Labour. And the idea that having had their worst results since 1931, the Labour government could somehow try to desperately to cling on in to office at a time when trust in politics is at such a low a point. I think people would look very, very warily at that and think that was quite extraordinary for a Labour Party to try and do that. Thank you very much. David. Jeremy, thank you very much. Um, I'm joined here by Vernon Bogdanor, who's Professor of Government at Oxford University, who's just uh, passed me a message about the Houghton and Sunderland South result. If that swing of 8.4% is repeated across the country, it will give the Conservatives an overall majority. We will not have a hung Parliament. That may or may not be a significant result. It's a safe Labour seat, but it also shows that perhaps the prediction about the Liberal Democrats may be right, that they're doing less well than in 2005. A very disappointing result for them. But as I say, it's only one seat. OK. And, and you've got news about one polling station that stayed open or well, something? Well, continuing news about the confusion about people trying to vote. In Sheffield, we know four polling stations were closed and there have been apologies. But one of our camera crew has been told that in at Lewisham, that the returning officer agreed to keep the polling station open an extra half an hour in order to allow those people to That's vote. Right. Meanwhile, in Manchester Withington, apparently almost 200 people were denied vote. I'm getting text messages from friends who tried to vote and could not vote. I think there was already controversy about our electoral system. This will hardly help. OK. The, um, let, let's have a look at this election and a different way. We have, Emily has these maps coloured in showing, you know, what's Labour, what's Liberal Democrat and all the rest of it which, of course, give a very weird picture, as she'll explain. Yeah, absolutely weird right. As my <laughs> team is focusing on that fine detail that's emerging uh, from these initial counts, I want to contrast the way the country looks now with what it might look like at the end of the night. And this is the way we voted nationally, constituency by constituency. But at a first glance, it looks as if the Conservatives won that election. Why? Well, because Conservative MPs tend to have these rather large rural constituencies, seats like Penrith and the Border or Ludlow, Dorset West there, the Lib Dem success, also magnified by these large rural areas in the north of Scotland, central Wales as well, whereas Labour MPs tend to be clustered around these dense urban conurbations. I'm thinking of Glasgow or Manchester, Birmingham, London. It's very hard to see just how many seats there are on this map. So what happens if I modify the map to give you a more accurate picture of what actually happened last time round? I'm going to make every single constituency the same size hexagon. And now you get a sense of what really happened there. London magnified on this lap. And really, the Conservative success is kept from... Uh, this bottom half of the country here, very little uh, movement up here, just one seat in Scotland, just three seats there. That's really why... Labour won, you can see much more clearly now. If I take us back to 1974, the last time we were in this position of a hung parliament, Heath unable to form a majority government, you can see there what was going on. More blue, but certainly much less of the Liberal Democrats, the Liberals as they were then. But a huge number of seats here in Scotland, 21 seats there, they've only got one now, remember. And look at what's happened here, eight seats in Wales. So really, the Conservative successes confined to this part of England, Wales and Scotland there. This is what we're waiting for tonight. Looking a bit lonely there, that one result in, but it'd be very interesting to see which kind of shape emerges if it is indeed a hung parliament. David. Thanks very much, Emily. The exit poll has been revised. Uh, not much comfort to anybody that it has been, but here it is. Uh, just a slight change. The Conservatives now on 305. That's uh, two fewer seats. 
and up 95 from the last election. Labour on 255 still, that's the same. And Liberal Democrats are up two on 61. So that puts them uh, minus one from last time. And the Conservatives short, I make that short by 21, 21 seats. Right. Oh, yes. Well, we're going to talk again and again about this living, uh, winning line of 326. That, yes. strictly speaking, is the majority you need. The reality is a little bit less than that. Sinn Féin MPs tend not to turn up, and they never have in the past. You can govern with ad hoc deals uh, with uh, the Ulster Unionists, if you're the Conservatives. So they will be happy with anything that approaches 310 or above. They believe it's possible to govern with less than that. And, of course, we haven't talked about the Ulster Unionists, which no doubt will come into play. The, the, the queues outside, it's quite extraordinary, these scenes. Look at this in Leeds, queues of people who were unable to vote, waiting to go and vote. It's a disgrace, this, isn't it? It's really a disgrace. It is really shocking uh, to see... Particularly well, since they've had so many more people doing postal voting, you'd think there'd be plenty of... Romans, look at that. It's both at one and the same time, isn't it? Very exciting to see the desire to vote, but the it's thought outrage. that in this country, in a democracy, people could want to vote and not be able it's, to it's, it's will cause fury. It's third world politics. It's badly done, and there ought to be an inquiry about it, because it's an absolute disgrace. Pictures in Ealing now, not just in Leeds, in Ealing as well. And as Nick Robinson was saying, his friends failed to vote. You should have got up out of bed earlier, Nick. <laughs> Let's go down and join Andrew. Andrew, were you able to vote, or were you... Perhaps he was queuing to vote, too. No, I didn't have to queue, but there were a lot of people in the uh, postal place where I did vote. It was very, very busy. We're very busy here. It's a beautiful night in central London. Views up and down the Thames. We're joined now by Michael Portillo, Mariella Frostrup, and with Ian Hislop. Michael, it looks like we're heading for a bad night for Labour. Maybe a very bad night. Not yet clear it's going to be a great night for the Tories? No, I agree entirely. Uh, the Tories appear to be some distance short of getting an overall majority, although on that first result, that swing would be enough just to put them beyond the 326 line. But even so, given the scale of the economic problems that the new government is going to have to face, I mean, really, even a small majority is not the comfortable place that you would like to be. And how would you feel about your old party having to be dependent on various shades of Ulster Unionist? Well, uh, I, I've known worse things happen. I mean, in, in a way, it's not what I think, it's what the markets think. Uh, with the news that we've had today from New York, uh, with the riots that have gone on today in Greece, uh, I mean, you and I are presently at a party. There are parties all over London. But in the morning, the parties will be over, and Britain is going to have to face up to these economic difficulties very quickly indeed. And uh, the new Prime Minister, if it is a new one, is going to have to seize this situation pretty quickly. The markets on the whole would feel me more reassured if that new Prime Minister had an overall majority. That may not happen, but whatever the circumstances, the Prime Minister of the day is going to have to convince the markets very quickly that he's going to be willing to take tough action. And some of that action may have to be taken on a faster time scale than we've been thinking, because events around the globe are clearly moving at a fantastic pace. Well, we'll get an indication of that when the gilt markets open at 1 a.m. They're opening specially at 1 a.m. this morning. Mariella, the last hurrah of Gordon Brown? I don't know. You know, I think it's very early in the evening. I don't it's think, very you know, early. It's a very male thing to be predicting stuff before you have a clue what's going to happen. I do think it's quite a All shame. All the women I know predict things as well. I think it's quite sad that we're still in complete trial to the markets, though. Having just gone through the absolute battering that we've had as a result of, you know, the banking crisis and the whole reliance on a, a market-based economy, to be sort of sitting here wondering what the markets are going well, to do. Well, that's because the, the government has borrowed do. so much. If you borrow 170 billion pounds a year from the markets the markets have got you by let's that. say the neck it's because we totally maybe rely more. on the markets and we haven't come up with a better and more you know a humane way of organizing our finance you know gordon brown do you think he thinks now this is the end i'm out of dining street i wouldn't dream of putting words or thoughts into gordon brown's mind or hands but i think He's had a very, very difficult couple of years, and I think he's emerged out of it very well. And I think that actually, when you look at what's happening across the rest of Europe, we're not yeah, it, in, the, it, in the terrible situation it, that we all like to imagine. Except it could be are. the worst Labour result since the 1930s. It could be, or it might not. This is true. What have you made of the campaign, Ian? Um, well, I'm just hoping that exit poll isn't right. 
Um, and why would that be? Well, um, because... Uh, this Are you was... a closet Lib Dem? Oh, no, I'm barely in the closet. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mariella. You're welcome. Um, no, I mean, just we're having been told that this is an exciting new departure for British politics, um, uh, the election is energised, all sorts of things are going to change. That exit poll makes it look depressingly like nothing is going to change. Um, and it's the two old parties more or less neck and neck with no um, actual clear winner at this stage. And then the Lib Dems um, trailing behind. Why, why isn't there a percentage figure? Um, the exit polls, as I understand it, don't do the percentage. Because They're just doing the, to work the seats doesn't help. But isn't the, and the they, percentage sorry, figure I doesn't... No. I don't percentage do figures thing. don't help Indeed. us. But you are. Here indeed. you are. I'm, uh, over you. I, I'm um, going to leave you now. But oh, you no. can carry on talking. Right, fine. Well, I'll do it now. I enjoyed that. Now, the party's really getting underway here, down on the banks of the Thames and the Silver Surgeon. So let's see now who's arrived. Who have we got here? David Badil, Dame Kelly Jones, Dom Jolly, Fern Britton. What have you made of this campaign? I'm just amazed by how quick Sunderland manages to count every time. What have they got, Rain Man counting? Only 55% voted there. Really? Is that why they do turnout. it? Small turnout. We they expect a much bigger turnout. Yeah. There's they another seat coming up in Sunderland. That'll be more really? interesting. Really? Is it all just Sunderland? What have you made of it? Well, for me, it's been like this mass participation event. Everyone's talking about it and getting ready for it, and we're now at this kind of pinnacle of championship and without knowing the outcome. I, I suppose from my point of view, it's knowing about the sport and legacy, the Commonwealth Games, Olympics coming, and really understanding the manifestos around sport, because I think it's going to make a big impact on us if we don't get that right. This campaign caught your attention. Has this been a good election? It's been a good election. I mean, I've been really impressed by the Lib Dems, not by Nick Clegg, but what have they done with Lembert Oping? Has he been killed? I mean, where is he? I mean, the one reason yeah, anyone says they're going to vote Lib Dem, all you have to do is say Lembit Opic, and they'd stop. But they've hidden him. I don't know where he is. You're just Lembit, looking... if you're there, ring us. <laughs> you're just looking for material. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and as we were saying over there, Fern, at the end of the day, if the exit poll is anywhere near right, and if, but if it is... Oh, well, we seem to have, we seem to have lost that. Now... Uh, Washington and Sunderland West we're waiting for. That's the, the, our second result. Again, a safe Labour seat. And uh, I don't know, we had a low turnout there and a majority of 17,000. But again, if this figure of swing is right, do you agree with Vernon about the 8.4% swing being significant or do you think it could just be an aberration? Well, I think it is significant as a first sign. Obviously, you want to see more signs than simply one. If we see it again in this seat, a squeezed Liberal Democrat vote and a big swing to the Conservatives, that will give the Conservatives the view that this is going to be a better night for them than the exit poll suggests. There's another seat, as we've already heard, in Sunderland, Sunderland Central, that the Conservatives have had their eye on. Now, it's not even on the list of their top 116 markets marginals, the ones they need to win in order to form a government, but they're desperate to show they have a presence in every region of the country. The North East has always mm. been an area of weakness for them, and it'll be interesting to see if they can do better there. But interesting, the, the exit poll said that incumbent Labour MPs would do better. So, I mean, and this is very much an incumbency, which is a new MP, but it's an incumbent new for, for Labour. Yeah. It's a seat they've had forever. Yes. And they ought to be doing better there. So if the 8.4, well, perhaps well, it it's could early be, to in, say in, Indeed. I mean, what we're going to see, I think, tonight is a whole series of these rival factors, if you like, incumbency yes. on the one hand, uh, people's perception of who the second party is on the other. The, the other thing that uh, is interesting about this uh, election is what effect. Remember all that furore about the expenses. And everybody said this would be the election where MPs were punished by the electorate for having cheated or misused their expenses. And uh, Jeremy, can you take a look at the expenses issue for us? Yes, I mean, there hasn't been an election since the war where we've had this number of MPs standing down, many because of the expenses scandal, and we put some of their faces on the dominoes here. So you can see Peter Vigors with the Duck Island and Margaret Moran, the dry rot, and some Labour MPs who are facing trial. Douglas Hogg had the moat, didn't he? And then, who else? Number of others. Anthony Steen with the house like Balmoral, Julie Kirkbride, Andrew Mackay and so on with their second home expenses gone. In fact, a, a large number gone, 152, not all because of the expenses, but certainly with the expenses related MPs, they've decided to just not contest the election. They've already been toppled.
And the question now is what happens to those MPs who are staying in, trying to get re-elected, but who have also had issues with their expenses, like, for example, Andrew Dismore here, or you can see Alan and Anne Keane, so-called Mr. and Mrs. Expenses, Shahid Malik with his plasma TV. What happens to them? They're seeking re-election. Do they also find that the voters decide to simply knock them down? We'll be watching later on to find out exactly what becomes of the MPs embroiled in the expenses scandal who are trying to get back into Parliament. David. Jeremy, thank you very much. Uh, let's join Rajini Vaidanathan, who's in Luton North with somebody, or Luton South, I think, actually, is somebody who was affected by this whole expenses scandal. Rajini. Yes, Luton South was a seat which was defined by the expenses scandal when the Labour MP here, Margaret Moran, was found to be claiming more than £20,000 for dry rock treatment on a second home. Only that second home was 100 miles away in Southampton. And a lot of outrage was really felt here in Luton as a result of that. And uh, as a result of that, there are 12 candidates on the ballot paper, which is a record, actually, this election for a number of candidates. And five of those are Not independent, choice. including television presenter to Esther Ranson, who I'm joined by now. Um, Esther, how has your campaign gone, do you think, so far? Well, I've enjoyed it enormously. I've been working here every day uh, since January. I've actually had a surgery here since September, getting to know Lutonians, trying to help them solve problems, some very heartbreaking problems, and it made me realise just what Margaret Moran was doing when she let down the, her constituents, because they haven't had an MP in Westminster since last May, and they've had a lot of work needed to be um, done here to help them to bring issues to the fore, take them to, to Westminster. So no wonder they're angry, and I'm angry for them. Just another quick question. A lot Go of on. people are saying that actually immigration and the economy are the two central topics here, as opposed to expenses. Is that something you found on the doorstep? I think there's an underlying current of rage. They actually feel they want someone to trust. That's what people have said to me in the street. And that's, I think, the only reason that people may vote for me is because of my track record. They feel they can trust me. Yes, of course, jobs matter, the economy matter, all those things matter, but trust matters more than anything. OK, well, we'll see if that trust plays out um, in the result tonight. We're expecting a result around 2.30, but it could be later because there are so many candidates here. And, uh, of course, you're hoping that you've done well here, but it looks like it's going to be a very, very close one. Labour, Liberal Democrats and the Conservative candidates here think they've got a shot too. Regini, thanks very much indeed. Well, we're waiting for Washington and Sunderland West. That'll be the next one we get. Vernon, it's interesting. Um, David Cameron said that two places were going to suffer when he makes these cuts that we all know are going to happen, and the background to this jolly election is going to be the horror of what happens after it. That uh, one of the places that they were going to have to make big cuts was the Northeast. Uh, not put like that, but because there were so many government jobs in the Northeast, and if you make cuts up there, uh, it would affect you know, a big proportion of the workforce. And yet they seem to be, you know, 8.4% swing to the Tories. Yes, he said the public sector was too large in the North East. That's absolutely right. And you might have expected that to affect the Conservative vote. But the evidence we have, and of course it's only one seat, we mustn't be too dogmatic, the evidence we have is that the Conservatives are doing better than expected in that part of the country, which is very good news for David Cameron. Uh, just picking up uh, continuing problems with these uh, voters taking part, we're now getting reports from London of the same thing, of people in Hackney being denied the right to vote, and Harriet Harman has told our colleagues on Radio 4 that the results may be legally challenged as a result of this. I think uh, we're hearing in Birmingham that the returning officer there took the view that providing people were in the room, they could vote <laughs> after 10pm. It was the doors that had to be locked. Absolutely and the fact right. that there is no consistency in the pro approach of returning officers, some slamming the doors shut in Sheffield, to the point that Nick Clegg has uh, gone to apologise in person to voters in Sheffield who feel that they've been denied the right to vote. I can't help feeling that this Tory will run right the way through the night. Could there be a legal challenge? Uh, there could be a legal challenge by a candidate who is some uh, few votes off saying that the uh, result was invalid they'd have to argue on the basis that not everybody had the chance to vote and then the interpretation of the law would be crucial were returning officers right to slam the door should they have made an effort to bring people inside and let them vote later labor all that would have to be considered by a court i'm keeping an eye on washington and sunderland west uh, there's a new seat one of those ones have been put together from four old constituencies so the result will be compared with 
what it would have been had these boundaries existed in 2005. It's where the Nissan car plant is with the optimism engendered by the Nissan decision to build the electric car there in Washington. Uh, Labour held, as I said before, with a majority of 17,000. Uh, the Liberal Democrats were in second place last time round and the Conservatives in third place, UKIP in fourth place. Perhaps we can just hear from Sophie Rayworth if they're about to come through. We thought it would be about a minute or so. Sophie? Yes, I think we are still a few minutes away and uh, given that they were hoping to declare by 11.15, again they are running behind time. Heavy turnout again is being blamed. I've been told of long queues in uh, polling booths here as well, although as I understand it, most people, everyone, I understand it, did get to vote. The candidates there gathering around the table again, the returning officer uh, is with them. Sharon Hodgson, who you may be able to see in the middle of them there in the red jacket, she is the, uh, the sitting MP. She is very relaxed, pretty relaxed this evening. She has a very rock-solid majority. This is, after all, uh, Labour's 11th safest seat in England, um, but still a few delays by the look of it. They should be coming back with a result very shortly. Election officers approaching them still, verifying, chatting. They're in their huddle now. I'm surprised. And we are seemingly in the last stages. I'm surprised, Sophie, that they blamed the turnout. It wasn't that much bigger, the turnout, compared with last year. I wonder whether everybody's underestimated the number we're going to vote anyway. Have there, there not been any, any stories up there like there have been in other parts of the country of people not getting, not being able to get into the polling stations, have there? No, they've, they've, there have been very long queues, that's what they've been saying, but they haven't said, they haven't been denied access after 10 o'clock. But there have been long queues, the, the turnout was on average about 50%. Here they come. Uh, something's gone wrong. Nick? Yes, we're hearing reports from East London, Hackney, of a sitting of, from voters who wanted to Can vote. I have your attention, please? I'm ready to declare the result for Washington and Sunderland West. I, Dave Smith, Acting Returning Officer, hereby give notice that the total number of votes for each candidate for the Washington and Sunderland West constituency is as follows. Peter Andrus, Liberal Democrats, 6,382. Ian Malcolm Cuthbert, Conservative Party candidate, 8,157. Sharon Hodgson, the Labour Party candidate, 19,000. Linda Hudson, United Kingdom Independence Party, 1,267. Yeah. Ian MacDonald, British National Party, 1,913. Yeah. And that Sharon Hodgson has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency. Sharon Hodgson, who's a government whip, who didn't uh, get Gateshead as her seat when this new seat was created. She used to be in Gateshead in Washington West, been there since 2005. Anyway, she takes the seat. Thank you. And I here's like the raw off, figures of her result, a majority of 11,458, down from 17,060, notionally, at the last election. Conservatives on 8,157. Liberal Democrat 6382, BNP on 1913, and UKIP. And this is the share. And let's see the change since last time. And now, importantly, the swing. 11.6% Conservative to Labour. Vast Labour to the Conservatives, vast. Remember that the swing from Labour to the Conservatives when Margaret Thatcher was elected was 5.3%. That is more than double that figure 
in one seat, but it's in a seat where you wouldn't expect the Conservatives to put any resource, any time, any effort really. <laughs> they had no hope of winning it. And if, if we keep having to say we've only got two results, it was repeated on anything like that scale, our exit poll is wildly underestimating what it's, they could it's do. It's more than the swing that Tony Blair got in 97. That's right. Which was the, uh, over the, around the 10% mark. We always knew that David Cameron to win this election would require a huge swing in historical terms. Not as big as Tony Blair's, which from memory was a little over 10%, uh, but this would be more than that. Really big. <coughs> Sorry. This is Brief. the largest swing we've seen since the war. If that swing was repeated across the country of 11%, it would be the largest swing we've seen since 1945. Let's drill down, Emily. We're drilling. Uh, remember, we weren't really expecting the Conservatives to take this, but what we are looking at is the inroads they're making in terms of the share of the vote. And once again, as with Houghton, we've seen the Conservative share go up 7% uh, percent there. They've also moved into second place from third place. The Lib Dems pushed down, although they've seen their share of the vote go up, they've actually been overtaken by the Conservatives. And a big drop for Labour, who have nonetheless held us in this staunchly, historically Labour part of the world. That's Peter. right, Emily. I would, if I were at Labour headquarters, I'd be starting to get quite worried by these figures. We've had two double-digit percentage drops in their share. As you say, the Liberal Democrats have, over, uh, have moved down to third place. The Conservatives must be delighted. But look at the turnout. Up seven points. It started off very low, well below 50%. But here we are getting an increase in turnout, and it doesn't seem to be helping Labour or the Liberal Democrats. First seat, we saw turnout uh, fractionally up. Uh, this one, up 7%. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Emily. So, we've had two results in. We're starting to get somewhere. They've had big swings from Labour to the Conservative in both cases, averaging at the moment 9.9% from two safe Labour seats. A lot to talk about, and I don't know whether the exit poll is standing up all that well. Jeremy. David, well, let's, uh, before we discuss that, we've been joined by Eric Pickles and Simon Hughes now. Um, what about this, these extraordinary scenes in the 20th cent 21st century Britain? People can't vote. This is appalling, isn't it? It's ridiculous. Of course I should be able to vote. I and mean, there's been some worries about the way in which uh, um, the corners have been cut at this election by returning officers. They all wanted to count uh, uh, tomorrow rather than tonight. Well, surely to goodness I could have just put the people in the polling station and continued. In we aren't going anywhere. After all, we could You're wait. in East London, Simon Hughesy. Uh, did, uh, did you hear reports about people not being able to vote? Um, I'd, I saw it coming. Earlier today, I phoned my agent, I asked him to phone our returning officer. I said, I've seen for myself cues that are not being dealt with as quickly as we need to. And I'd had a very reliable colleague tell me the same. And I saw that this evening, when most people turn out to vote, because the bulk voting is from 6 o'clock, we were likely to run into trouble. And I said, please get the resources in. This is not a party point at all, but um, Harriet Harman has already intimated there may be challenges to some of, some of the results that are going to come tonight? Well, there may be. I mean, I think what returning officers should have done is, as they the, seem to have done in Birmingham, brought everyone in and locked the door. I mean, the, the point about this is that you, know, you, you do really have to have a closing time. I mean, your exit poll, other people coming in, possibly sure. influencing votes, etc. But if you bring everyone in and, in, in a sense, insulate them from the outside world, uh, that would be a way forward. I mean, I'm concerned about it because traditionally, conserv more conservatives vote earlier in the day and more Labour people vote in well, the final uh, uh, couple uh, of uh, hours of polling. Of course, you're spared all this inconvenience by being mem member, <laughs> a member of the House of Lords. But I know, but I, I'm still worried for my party. Absolutely. And I'm worried about Labour voters not being able to cast I've their votes. I've noticed you sitting there. Are you, I mean, on your, on your phone, are you, uh, maybe you're twittering or something. So my glasses. No, you've, got, you, you've got it in your pocket. Hang on a second. I'm told now we've got Bill Cash, who, who's joining us now from his uh, county in Staffordshire. Bill Cash, why does David Cameron not seem to have done as well as he might have done? Well, I don't think we really know yet because this exit poll seems to be producing some very unpredictable results. So, quite frankly, I think we're in speculation territory. Having mm. said that, I have to say it's on the doorstep, certainly in my constituency and nearby. Uh, immigration was extremely high on the list and so were questions relating to EU immigration, the EU and, of course, the economy and the truth about the national debt. So I do think that uh, there are a lot of issues which are going to 
make a big difference in relation to marginals. At the moment, we're not in marginal territory in your program, and I think that uh, it's very important for us to remember that it's the marginals that are going to make the deciding factor. But you have a serious anxiety about whether David Cameron has delivered. No, I'm saying that we don't know. And what I am saying is that there is a huge okay. amount at stake of the country. I mean, a Lib Lab pact uh, with uh, Miliband, Mandelson and Clegg would actually be a kind of Greek tragedy. If you look at the, if you look at the situation in Greece okay. at the moment and the critical right. position on the stock okay, market in, in New York, uh, Bill Cash, I think there is a big problem there. Hang on a second, please, uh, Peter Massa. People are clearly very, very exercised about whether by hook or by crook the Labour Party is going to try to hang on to government. Look, this isn't an academic exercise, no, Jeremy. It's certainly what they not. want is a good, strong, stable government. Well, who now, is they? Well, the public, the voters, the electorate, the people who decide this election. Now, they've cast their votes. Now, we don't know what the outcome is. We don't know what the results are. All we have is an exit poll, which, on the face of it, uh, is becoming slightly dented by one or two of the swings mm. we've seen from the uh, declared results. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, what the public want is a good government and they will, they will either get it if it's a hung parliament from a sort of the wobbly is wobbly wobbly minority voting, as you well know, a wobbly Eric minority Pickles, tory government or an alternative nobody elected gordon brown he hasn't stood up for any kind of election he's there as prime minister he's lost over 100 seats there is no way that this man who has failed this electoral task can possibly contemplate forming a government but I mean, uh, we're not certain in terms of what the exit poll is going to be. We've seen two results uh, which are uh, completely at variance with um, the exit poll. Um, and maybe perhaps on the basis of just two results, we can't declare this election over just yet. No, of course we can't. But I mean, I Simon that. Hughes is a thoroughgoing Democrat. You can't countenance any sort of arrangement that keeps in Downing Street a man who has never won an election. Well, Jeremy, like everybody else, I wanted to see both, both a few more results, please, and also the share of the vote. Because one thing Nick Clegg was very clear, if Gordon Brown went from being uh, the majority party leader to being in third place, clearly his position would be untenable. But if we've had an entirely distorted election result, if the figures of seats don't reflect the shares of the vote, then, to be fair, the public doesn't have an easy answer delivered by some constitutional thought. We're clear what we want. And if it looks as if it's going to be a balanced parliament, no majority for the Tories. We're going to go into bat for the fairer taxation, for the investment team. So you team. wouldn't do a deal with Labour? No, no, no. I said we, we, we are clear what we want, which is the policy outcomes. We want a change in the tax policy. We want a uh, pulling up by the roots of the sure. political system. We and want if investment gave for you green that, jobs. You'd do a deal with them. Well, there's been <laughs> we haven't had any conversation with anybody. We, the Tories have shown no, no sign of wanting to have a modern political system. The Labour Party made a deathbed conversion the other day. They're hardly either immediately desirable oh, colleagues. Thank you very much. No, no I've, been, I've been advocating a change in the electoral system since the yes. mid-1990s. Yeah, and many of no your party disagree with you, as you know, Eric Pickles. <laughs> I mean, I want to see fair votes. I want to see all the constituencies to be oh. roughly the same size and reduced in numbers. OK. All right, David? Thank you, Jeremy. Well, we're waiting to go up to Sunderland again for the Sunderland Central result. It's worth just pointing out at the moment that the exit poll uh, adjusted uh, suggested a swing from Labour to Conservative of about 5.5%. The two results we've had in from Sunderland, and admittedly their new constituencies, new boundaries, is suggesting a swing from Labour to the Conservatives of 9.9%, which will give the Tories an overall majority. Anyway, Sunderland Central, now this is way out for the Tories. It's 230th on their target list, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how this one goes. Uh, the old MP, Bill Etherington, is standing down, and a new Labour candidate, Julie Elliott, comes in, and the Conservative is the leader of the Conservative group on Sunderland City Council. Sophie, they are about to go again, I think, aren't they? They look like they are about to go again, and this certainly is the one to watch. I've spoken to both candidates. They both think it is very close. You may be able to see Lee Martin pacing there, Julie Elliott as well, both new candidates, as you say. But this is David Cameron's wild card, this seat. If they did get a Conservative MP in this seat, in this new seat, it would be the first Conservative MP in Sunderland since 1963. Now, they need a 12.8% swing 
if they're going to do that. The point about this seat is that because of the boundary changes, it now takes in basically conservative strongholds in Sunderland. And that is why the Conservatives have led such a concerted campaign here. Lee Martin, he's 35 years old, he's leader of the opposition in the city council, a very well-known figure here. He's led a very high-profile, very active campaign. Whether or not he can do it, we may be about to find out. They are uh, just checking again, a little bit of activity around the desk, though uh, it could be a while, a few minutes still, before they come back. It was David but Cameron, it is certainly going it, to be Sophie? the very interesting result of the night. David Given the last result and the swing to the Conservatives, 12.8%, that's what they need here tonight, if Lee Martin is going to take it and become the first Conservative candidate for David, decades. David, David Cameron. Elliot, though, looking <coughs> fairly relaxed. OK, um, well, we'll go back to Sunderland South, told, Sunderland Central in a, a moment, Sophie. Ago, could be just a few Thank you very much. Uh, this was the seat, David Cameron said, it's one of the places he'd been watching on election night. I'm joined by George Osborne, Shadow Chancellor, the man who might be in charge of the economy. First of all, uh, if, if the Tories get a majority, Mr Osborne, I ought to ask you, first of all, what you make of what's happening in world markets tonight. Well, it's clearly a very uncertain time in world markets, and Britain will need a stable and responsible government, uh, and I believe looking at the exit polls, and of course we haven't had uh, many of the results yet, but on the basis of that, I think it's pretty clear uh, that Labour cannot continue in government. And I've been listening to some of the Labour politicians on this programme, and to coin a phrase, I think they need to get real. They've been rejected by the British people, and Britain needs a change of government. So you think there's no question, if the Tories don't have an overall majority, but are the largest party, no question at all of the other two parties getting together to keep uh, Labour effectively in office? I don't think there's any question at all of Labour being able to continue in office. This is a massive rejection of the Labour Party. The Conservative Party has gained more seats on the basis of your exit poll than at any time since 1931, 80 years, and uh, a huge swing as well. So I find it extraordinary uh, listening to those Labour politicians okay. on your programme. Uh, can you stay with us, Mr Osborne, because we're just getting the results. Of course, like your central constituency is as follows. Paul Dixon, Liberal Democrats, 7,191. <laughs> Julie Elliott, the Labour Party candidate, 19,000. Pauline Fentonby Warren, United Kingdom Independence Party, 1,094. Lee Martin, Conservative Party candidate, 12,770. John Vincent, John Vincent McCaffrey, British National Party, 1,913, and that Julie Elliott has been duly elected to serve as member of the said constituency. Here are the results then. Labour did hold the seat with a healthy majority, 6,725, previously 9,400, 9,500, just under. There's the uh, majority now, and the turnout, 57%. That's up from 50% last time. Let's have a look at the change in Sunderland Central. A much reconstructed seat. Labour down five, the Conservatives up five, and that predicates a swing just under five percentage points, 4.8 percent Labour to Conservative, and overall 8.2 percent swing now running from Labour to Conservatives. Emily. Yeah, I was just having a little um, play with that to see what really jumps out, and again, they have done this big leap here, the Conservatives. I mean, when the result came through, 
definitely sounds as if they'd improved. Labour down just five, not as much as in the other seats, Peter. And also, a word about the BMP, which we saw in the last seat had done pretty well getting into fourth place and here as well. Uh, Emily, I was preparing to say how Sunderland might be different from the rest of the country, but what's happening is that one part of Sunderland is different from another part mm. of Sunderland. A clear swing to the Conservatives, but a 5% swing compared with an 85 and 11% swings in the other seats. Now, as Vernon Bogdan rightly said a little while ago, on the earlier seats, the Conservatives would be looking forward to uh, an outright majority. On this sort of swing, they don't. We're definitely in hung parliament territory. But the BNP here, nothing. 1%. There were 5% though in Washington and Sunderland South. We're not yet getting much evidence of a breakthrough by the small parties. But Labour will be feeling slightly more comfortable and the Tories perhaps slightly more nervous after this declaration compared with the previous ones. And absolutely no movement there for the Lib Dems, which is something that we'll look out for uh, a little later in the evening. David? Uh, you heard all that, Mr Osborne. Um, David Cameron said it was one of the places he was going to be watching. What do you think he'd conclude and what do you conclude from that result? Well, look, there is uh, still a really decisive swing taking place in this election. We only had three results. Uh, we got your exit poll and the Labour Party had been rejected by the British people. And I think Labour politicians, as I say, need to get real. They need to understand that a democratic process has taken place. And the idea of Gordon Brown and the Labour Party clinging on to power after being so decisively rejected would really, frankly, shock many people. I take that point. Uh, what would your procedure be then if you don't have an overall majority uh, and you don't have an automatic majority in the House of Commons where you can do what you want and your own Conservative MPs will support you? What would you do? Well, uh, I'm, I'm no doubt going to be on this programme several times over the next 12 hours or more and we can talk about that situation, if it arises, I mean, people need to know that David Cameron and the Conservatives will do what needs to be done to give this country a responsible, strong and decisive government at a time when the economy is uncertain and when the country wants change. Well, uh, I hope we'll explore these issues further with you through the night. Thank you for joining us for these first three results, Mr. Osborne. And let's now have a look at how things stand. It's uh, coming up to quarter to midnight. Fiona. Yes, indeed. Let's see where we've got to so far at this point in the evening. Just three seats have declared so far. And according to tonight's exit poll, it looks like we are heading for a hung parliament, the first since 1974. The Conservatives would be the largest party, but would not have overall control. It suggests the Conservatives would have the most seats, 305, but that would leave them 21 seats short of an outright majority. Labour would have 255 seats. Liberal Democrats would be in third place with 61, other parties with 29. And the figures are based on a sample of people from across the country who were asked how they voted today when they left their polling station. Now, I should say, of course, all polls have a margin of error, which could well be significant in such a tight election. We're seeing the swings already in just the three seats we've seen so far. We had a clearer picture as more results come in. Now, a number of polling stations across the country have been caught out by a large turnout. There have been extraordinary scenes as some have closed and turned away queues of people outside before they got a chance to vote. The Labour Deputy Leader Harriet Harman has said results are potentially open to a legal challenge if they're close. In Sheffield, the returning officer has apologised profusely to residents unable to vote. Now, this was the scene in Sheffield Hallam, that's Nick Clegg's constituency, with people queuing around the block as the 10 o'clock deadline approached. As police were called in to move people on, one local resident voiced her frustration. It's shocking. Yeah. There's about a hundred people who haven't been able to vote, who are really cared. I mean, it was pouring with rain. So, you know, we take it very seriously and it's terribly undemocratic. And I think everybody's very angry. Here, yeah. here. Yeah. 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 Well, among the other polling stations caught out by the late surge in voter demand was Leeds, with just half an hour to go until the voting deadline was up. This was the scene with queues, look, you can see them there, right along the street. And there were similar scenes at a polling station in Ealing in West London where people were having to line up outside before casting their vote. And there have been reports of more disruption at other counts in Lewisham, Hackney and Lambeth and other parts of London with police in attendance and more reports are still coming in. The former UK Independence Party leader is recovering from a plane crash. Nigel Farage was a passenger in a light aircraft which plummeted to the ground shortly after taking off from an airfield near Brackley in Northamptonshire. 
Mr Farage is being treated in hospital for broken ribs and minor injuries. He's standing for the seat of Buckingham tonight, so you may have to hear the result from his hospital bed. And incidentally, as well as following us live here in the studio, you can also check every detail and follow live updates from your constituency right through to the final result online. That's at bbc.co.uk election. So there we have it. Just to recap, extraordinary scenes at the polling stations and according to tonight's exit poll, it looks as if we are heading for a hung parliament, that's at the moment, with the Conservatives as the largest party. Thanks very much, uh, Fiona. Well, um, it's all to play for, really, with this exit poll, as far as I can see. Um, the BNP, we'll be looking at their figures, but their leader, Nick Griffin, is just arriving at Barking, where he's standing against Margaret Hodge, the Labour candidate. And they're hoping not only to take this seat uh, in Parliament, it will be the first time the BNP or indeed any uh, party of that ilk, the far right with racist views, had been in the House of Commons, but they're also hoping to take Barking Council tonight. There are elections going on there, but they won't be announced until tomorrow. And Nick Griffin talking to a few of his supporters behind him, perhaps one of his um, bodyguard. Well. Let's uh, leave Barking for a moment. Just one more word on these, this increasing scandal about the voting system tonight. Uh, we're told that one polling station actually had run out of ballot papers. So the people going there, if they did get in, couldn't vote because they had no ballot papers. And that another polling station, because of the queue, stayed open an extra 10 minutes. Now that means that those people were voting after the exit poll had been published. And there's sure to be, or certainly could be, a legal challenge there. It is, um, hmm, it's a rum job and it's pretty chaotic, yes. David, and we've now had a statement from the returning officer for Sheffield who's been apologising and explaining why. He says in a statement, John Mothersall, we got this wrong, I'd like to apologise. We were faced with a difficult situation with the numbers of people and a large amount of students turning up to vote without polling cards. This, he goes on, made the administrative process of ensuring the correct person was given a ballot paper much longer. The only remedy which we could not take, he says, was to extend the voting times. His problem is, in some places, they did extend the voting times. It's chaos. We heard also in, in the news roundup then a reminder of um, Nigel Farage being injured in that plane crash early this morning, the UKIP candidate who's standing in Buckingham against the speaker, John Burka. David Shookman is outside the hospital where Nigel Farage is. Uh, David, uh, do you have any news about how he is? Yes, David, I, I couldn't hear your question very clearly, but the, the latest we have is that Nigel Farage is here in a stable condition. Uh, his pilot is also in a stable condition, one of the more flamboyant election stunts coming to a pretty sticky end. What they were trying to do this morning was haul into the air a UKIP banner behind a large a light aircraft to fly in the skies over Buckingham to try to urge the citizens of that constituency to turn against the MP there, John Burkow, the uh, Speaker of the House of Commons. For some reason that no one can quite work out, the plane crashed onto the airfield, ended up upside down, with the result that the pilot had to be cut out, an operation that took about an hour. Nigel Farage himself was taken uh, was able to walk but was then taken to a local hospital at Banbury but then brought here for specialist care at the John Radcliffe Hospital with quite a long list of injuries, two broken ribs, a damaged sternum, a chipped spine and cuts and bruises. Now UKIP say that he will definitely not be able to attend the Buckingham Count tomorrow. His agent will have to stand in for him. There is speculation that the UKIP chairman, Lord Pearson, may turn up. I am told that Nigel Farage is watching election coverage on television and that's how he'll have to watch his own count tomorrow afternoon. David, thank you very much indeed. Well, any more news on that front we'll have and of course we'll have the result from Buckingham at some point tonight, I have no doubt, or tomorrow maybe. Uh, let's join Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy. 
David, thank you very much. Well, with us now is Tessa Chow, the Olympics Minister. Let's talk a little bit about this polling chaos. It's a scandal, isn't it? Well, I think it is. Uh, I mean, I've literally walked into your reports about this because mm. um, certainly as far as I'm aware, in my, in my own constituency, which straddles part of uh, Southwark uh, w with Simon and Lambeth, there haven't been problems on this kind of scale. But we did know that turnout uh, has been very high indeed. But, you know, I mean, these are queues of people exercising their democratic right and then being denied it through no fault other than the failure of the system to organize itself to deal with the capacity as it turned out. Partly your fault though, I mean you've been in government 13 years, you could at least have been able people Jeremy, to vote. Listen, you can say everything's our fault and you know well, to some extent we have to, are. you know we have to accept many things are, you're absolutely right but I think that uh, the administration of elections falls mm. to the returning officers of local authorities and mm. I think that Harriet Harman is right Eric that Pickles, um, it yeah. will be important to investigate the individual circumstances. Well, let's not forget the Electoral Commission we have a, a commission here that's supposed to ensure that elections are fair and monitored. How can it be that a polling station can actually run out of ballot papers? So the Electoral Commission failed? I mean, the Electoral Commission, I, should, I would hope, would come down like a ton of bricks mm. on any returning officer uh, that had queues out at 10 o'clock. Uh, any returning officer that didn't have enough ballot papers. After all, you do know the number of people who are going to vote in every polling station and not to have sufficient ballot papers to meet that need seems to me to be ridiculous because everybody knew that there was going to be a bigger turnout. It's all right saying, you know, we, we assume there isn't going to be much of a turnout, therefore we don't really need to put on the staff. That wasn't going to be the case. Jeremy, I don't know what your view is, but my view is that we still have a very anti-Diluvian system. Um, oh. In the sense that uh, why it should be logical, possible, for people to be able to go to vote anywhere in the constituency, in my view, nowadays with modern, you have the full electoral register. People don't often know where their polling station is. And we ought to have polling stations where the bulk of people go by the okay. railway station. Let's, the go, let's go back to the substance of tonight's the business. The batteries in also Who businesses. has won this election? Who holds power in this country, Eric Pickles? Well, we've now got three results in so far, and an exit poll. <laughs> and an exit poll. Could, I, could I quietly suggest to you, it might be just a tad early to suggest that, but, but we can say like, who's lost. I, I think it's fair to say that Mr Gordon Brown and the Labour Party have lost. Okay, well, look, hang on a second, because I think we can be joined now by um, David Miliband, who join, joins us from his count, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary. I see you're quoted as saying that no party has the moral right to power at this point on the basis of the predicted result. No, that's not right, Jeremy. What I said was that if no party has an absolute majority in the House of Commons, then no party has the moral right to a monopoly of power. Uh, our system is absolutely clear that if you have 325, 326 seats, then you do have the right to form a government. If no party reaches that level, then really the injunction from the voters is for parties to talk to each other. If and it's true, therefore, in that sense, if the people of this country have decisively not chosen Gordon Brown as their Prime Minister, it's time for someone else at least to lead your party, isn't it? We're very clear that we've got a strong leader of our party, we've got a strong team of which I'm privileged to be a part, and we've also got a very strong programme. At this stage, I think that we've got enough excitement with the uh, results coming in and the exit poll that you've got. I think it's maybe just worth pointing out Sunderland Central is the next door seat to South Shields. Uh, I think it's a very significant result for the following reason. Uh, the other two Sunderland seats, I don't think the Tories were really putting much effort into, but in Sunderland Central, there was a massive amount of Ashcroft money. And it's very striking indeed that the swing there should have been half the level in one of the other Sunderland it seats. And a third of, uh, half what it was in the, the seats where they really didn't try at all, according to you. But just to be clear about the position of your leader, it's Gordon Brown or Bust, is it? Absolutely. He's our leader okay. of the party. Uh, he has led, I think that most people would accept that Gordon really found his voice uh, especially towards the end of the campaign. Uh, the authentic Gordon Brown was fighting for fairness in the last days of the campaign. 
And I think it's very important that if indeed there is an injunction from the people for a new type of politics that involves politicians talking to each other, then we should do that. But let's yeah, so wait until you, we get the okay. results, because I think there's probably a lot more excitement before the night's out. All right, well, I, I'm not going to go to you, Eric, because you're just sitting there rolling your eyes at hearing him. David Dimbleby. Jeremy, thank you very much. Well, more on this scandal of people not being allowed to vote, and one that could be potentially uh, quite divisive and lead to a legal challenge. Chester. Chester is a marginal seat held by Labour with a majority of 973. The Labour Party is claiming that more than 600 people were turned away from the polling stations because the polling lists haven't been updated. So they were registered to vote, but the list hadn't been updated. So when they turned up and said, my name is John Smith, they were told, oh, no, not on the list. Well, that'll cause trouble too. Let's have a look at the Liberal Democrats come here because we, the polls, uh, the exit poll has given the Liberal Democrats a disappointing night. Uh, down one yeah. last time round. Considering how, what a buoyant campaign Nick Clegg appeared to have, it's a very strange thing. But I mean, we'll only discover it when we get the results in. But what are the places the Lib Dems are most enthusiastic about taking or think they can have? Well, well as you say, so much of this campaign has seemed to centre around the emergence, if you like of Nick Clegg and they will be very disappointed with these exit polls but they may defy them. We've picked out some marginals, places that they're very keen to take. One is the city of Durham. Now a big student population here. The Lib Dems did very well last time round on the anti-Iraq war vote and on the tuition fees vote. They're in second place. This is something that they think that they can take quite easily from Labour. Let me show you one where the battle is with the Conservatives flip-flopping between Conservative and Lib Dem uh, MPs here in Guildford. Very, very tight race. Sue Doughty uh, has been the MP there before and she is the Lib Dem candidate now. So this one looked very, very close, but will the exit polls scupper that? And the other one I want to show you is Red very, very low down on the Lib Dem target list, 240 something. But they have been targeting this in recent weeks, thinking they could pull this off. And we've just heard, even though that gap is huge, if I bring in Peter Kellner now, a very tight race at the count going on here. This is a seat uh, that the Liberal Democrats have targeted and thought they were with an outside chance. It was a bit like Sunderland Central for the Tories, red car for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, you know, one of those seats which might just go. And the news from the count tonight is it's very close. Well, that implies, given the Labour had a 30% majority, 12,000 votes majority, if the Liberal Democrats even come close, this suggests a huge swing to them. And as for Durham and Guildford, their seats, which on the exit poll, probably would not go Liberal Democrat. If they take them, it'll start to suggest the exit poll is wrong. And of course, it's not just about how the Liberal Democrats do, Emily, because if they do start picking up seats, it affects the Tory and Labour share. And if the Liberal Democrats do take seats, do they damage the Conservatives more or Labour more? And that will affect the big picture at the end of the night as who can form a government. Peter, thanks. One other bit of news coming out of the city of Durham is that the count may be delayed. It will be pushed back by what we're hearing is big turnout there. David. Thanks very much. Gordon Brown, Prime Minister, has uh, just been to his count and left. I don't know what time he gets in Kikodi and Cowdenbeath. He's leaving his house to go. Leaving his house to go to the count. Slightly different point. Majority of 18,000 there, Gordon Brown has. The man who became Prime Minister in June 2007, having been the longest serving Chancellor ever, ten, over 10 years as Chancellor of the Exchequer and a man who, it was said, recovered a sort of energy in the last couple of days of the campaign, having had a number of difficulties during it. Uh, too well known to recount again at this stage, but let's go and have a look at the, uh, at the likely upshot of all this with Jeremy Vine and uh, who's going to get to number 10 and how they get there, Jeremy. David, you join me inside our interior of number 10 Downing Street and up the stairs here you can see the portraits of Prime Ministers on the walls just to give us a bit of context on hung parliaments. Exit poll tonight suggesting there might well be one. 
Have there been many? The answer is more than you might think. So 1910, back 100 years, Herbert Asquith here came first in two elections but did not get an overall majority, had to govern with the support of smaller parties. Hung parliament, minority government with support. Same again with Stanley Baldwin, 1923, and he was 50 seats short, only lasted six weeks. You can see how long each government lasted underneath the picture. He did then win a subsequent election with an overall majority. Maybe a lesson for David Cameron there. 1929, Ramsay MacDonald, rather more successful, kept on for over two years with a minority government. And then we have this election classic, February 1974, so tight. Ted Heath trying to remain PM with fewer seats than Labour and lasted three days. And you're hearing maybe echoes of that story in some of the conversations we've already had in the studio tonight. After he stepped down, in comes Harold Wilson. He's Prime Minister, 17 seats short for five months. And then, of course, you have the October election. He's re-elected, but he hands over to James Callaghan. And James Callaghan loses his majority. And here, for the first time on the staircase, you actually have a formal coalition, the Lib Lab Pact. Jim Callaghan, 1977, again, didn't last very long. He has to struggle on afterwards for another eight months after that pact falls apart. And just one more example for you, which is often glossed over. John Major, in 1996, started with a very small majority. It came down because of death and defection, and he had a fairly torrid five months in a minority with the support of the Ulster Unionists. So if you go down this staircase, you actually only see one example here of a formal coalition and the lesson seems to be they don't tend to end in formal coalitions hung parliaments they often end with the largest party governing with occasional support policy by policy and secondly it's happened perhaps more often in recent history than we might imagine david jeremy thanks very much well sitting beside me here in the center of the studio peter hennessy is professor of contemporary british history and has written about government endlessly and talked about it endlessly just take us through what you think the implication of this exit poll and a hung parliament is for the, for the carrying on of government. Well, it was the Duke of Wellington in 1834 who said the King's government must be carried on. And then that's the principle. The Queen's government must be carried on. There's always got to be a government there. Under our system, there's only a gap of one hour between one Prime Minister going to the palace to resign and the other coming back from the palace to take the applause on the steps of number 10. And the Constitution is what it is. Uh, notice that Nick Clegg and David Cameron made very cutting remarks about the tacit understandings that were made plain in a document prepared by the Palace and the Cabinet Office that was given to the Justice Select Committee at the end of February. But the Constitution is what it is. The Queen is only activated if the Prime Minister of the day resigns or he loses a vote of confidence, which a loss of a Queen's speech vote would be. You see, the Queen is crucial here, she must not be politicised, but the Queen is like Heineken Lager in our Constitution. There are parts of the Constitution that only she can reach. You cannot become Prime Minister without kissing hands with the Queen, and the Queen is only activated in certain circumstances. But so what so all this talk practice? of moral right, yes. all this talk of moral right is wildly misleading. In the end, it's nothing to do with moral rights, it's how the parliamentary arithmetic plays out if it goes to the wire at the end of this month mm. on a vote on but the But this Queen's was speech. David Miliband talking about the moral right, wasn't it, a yes. moment ago here? But well, politicians, but when they're about to lose power, about to gain it, can say things which are slightly, slightly okay. squiffy. But what in reality do you think will happen? I mean, supposing that exit poll is correct, supposing the Tories don't have a majority, a, a working majority in the House of Commons. Well, today, because we're now past midnight, Friday, could be one of those days when the British Constitution goes on heat. And the Cabinet Office has got teams of four already to help with the brokerage. They won't take decisions, the Cabinet Office, at all. They're there to broker and to talk to people and to give practical advice, ready to go from tomorrow afternoon. But my hunch, David, would be if it is, if it is seriously hung, it will begin on, in earnest on Saturday morning. But equally, if David Cameron could go, uh, could, I mean, could he kick Gordon Brown out, which is what the Tories here are suggesting effectively, or Gordon Brown would go because he'd, he'd not done as well as he might, and could David Cameron go with a minority to the House of Commons and put a Queen's speech in and all the rest of it? He could. Mr Cameron will only be sent for if Gordon Brown resigns. And right. That is the plain fact of the Constitution. So it's, uh, the Tories' game is to put as much pressure on him to resign Indeed, as they he can. Indeed, they can claim all they Nick, like. what do you think? You're seeing two games, aren't you? On the yeah. one hand, the Tories need to say there's a massive swing in our favour. Gordon Brown has lost. We have the right. They might even have used the phrase the moral right to have government. On the other hand, you're seeing a concerted effort from the Cabinet to say, 
in David Miliband's word, that there is no moral right to a monopoly of power. The most overt wooing of the Liberal Democrats we've ever seen, they suddenly discover that they're very, very keen on electoral reform. They agree with them on the economy and they think a coalition is the best way it is implied to deal with the economic crisis. This is a, a battle of two arguments. It is clear to me, though, if the Tories were above 300 seats in the Commons, they could quite easily get their business done with the help of abstentions by some parties, with the help of some support, even on an ad hoc basis, it's quite possible. If our exit poll is wrong and they do worse than that, though, Dave, then you start to get into the territory where it will be quite difficult and Labour and the Liberal Democrats might be tempted to say, well, look, if we combined, we'd be stronger. All right. Well, we've got a long way to go. The Electoral Commission have come out and issued an unprecedented apology, in effect, or rebuke, if you like. The Electoral Commission is going to be undertaking a thorough review of what has happened. This is about people getting to the polling stations and not being able to vote. There should have been sufficient resources allocated to ensure everyone who wished to vote was able to do so. And they said they had to close, close the polls at 10, but anyone with a ballot paper by 10 should be allowed to use it. And this is where voters have been locked out. Manchester Withington, Hackney South, Sheffield Hallam, Penniston and City of Chester. And there may be more to come. We don't know, we'll see. Let's join Kirsty Walk now at, in Whitney where David Cameron's house is and where he's... In, oh, Nick Clegg, I'm sorry. We're going to go to Sheffield and join Nick Clegg and Kirsty Walk. Kirsty, I gave you the wrong man. David, hello. I'm, I'm outside Nick Clegg's house with two of these would-be voters that didn't get a chance to cast their vote today. Before I speak to them, I spoke very briefly to Miriam Clegg earlier and she expressed disbelief that such a thing would happen. And actually, it's strange when you think that we send observers into other countries to make sure voting is fair. Now, with me is Joe Beadle and Neil Shacker. Tell me, first of all, what happened to you? Returning for the third time in sort of two hours, we joined a queue in the rain and people were standing quite patiently in the rain, best part of 100, 150 people, and everybody was asking the question, what happens if it gets to 10 o'clock and nobody knew? And nobody came out and said to you, we've got problems in here, we don't have enough people to take these votes? Nobody came out until two minutes after 10 and basically said, if you're not in the room, we cannot accept your vote, at which time a lot of people got very upset. Jo, uh, you couldn't cast your vote either? No, I'm exactly the same as Neil. Um, I looked in the polling station or at the queue at 6 o'clock on the way home from work. I came back again at 7, I came back again at 8. Finally, at quarter past 9, I thought, I've got to come back and I've got to queue. There was, I was one of about 150 um, and we were all anxious uh, because we didn't know we would be allowed to vote. But we thought, surely, in a democracy, we'd be allowed to vote. And you're people that regularly vote? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, and people had made an effort to be there. It was raining, uh, but people wanted to be there. They wanted to vote, and we just weren't allowed to. Now, we've heard that uh, in other places, for instance, Birmingham, the returning officers simply asked everybody to come in and shut and lock the door. That was never an option. That was not the case here. The word filtered out. In fact, no staff from inside came out. When I heard the rumours coming down the line, I was so annoyed, I went inside and the three staff behind the, uh, behind the table, it wasn't their fault, but they kept referring to the fact that if they accepted votes, it would be illegal. Thank you very much indeed. We know that not necessarily is the case and we know the returning officer here in Sheffield has apologised. Back to you, David. Thanks, Kirsty. And now we do go over to Whitney and David Cameron's house and he's coming out there on his way to his count. I don't know you can actually see anybody in the back of that silver car, but anyway, we're told that's him. Or that is he, I should say. And he disappears into the darkness for his count in Whitney, where he has a majority of nearly 14,000, so he's safe as houses, of course, from that point of view. Uh, there's been a bomb alert in Northern Ireland. The count for Foyle and for East London Dairy constituencies, those are their names, have been evacuated because of a bomb alert. A car was abandoned in the car park, police sealed it off, army bomb squad on their way. Let's go back down to the Thames now and join Andrew Neil. Andrew. Apologies for that little park out earlier. I'm glad to say the director general of the BBC has turned up, gave me a shilling, we stuck it in the meter, and we're back on air. And to make up for being off air, we have a trio of intellectuals, two historians and an author. Simon Shammer in the middle here, Mr. Starkey here, and Martin Amos there. 
David Starkey, has this the makings of a historic election still or not? Just about. Um, I think the, the issue is whether or not there is the hung parliament, what the alliances are. On the other hand, I think this has got the makings of a profoundly unhistoric election. The British public should have had a choice, it flunked it. Equally, the politicians didn't present them with a real choice, they flunked Why it. Why did too. they flunk it? because they were frightened and um, we have got, if you like, I call this the L'Oreal election because you're worth it. We've all got used from 1997. You're watching too many TV commercials. Well, of course, I've even watched you. Um, <laughs> uh, though you were not adver advertising cosmetics, it has to be said. I think. And uh, he's <laughs> making faces beside this. You see two historians, <laughs> two opinions. What's the choice? The choice if they'd have been truthful with us about how, what they're going to do about the deficit. Who's the biggest? No, it's how we're all going to die. Are we going to die by a thousand cuts? Are we going to die by hemlock? Or are we going to die by, you know, the gas of rising fats? I'm which not surprised. Show, which we didn't party get the was choice. offering hemlock? Um, none of them. Um, none of them. Well, the Labour Party really, actually, as befits Only the, gloom, self, the, gloomy, suicide. No, the gloomy. Bring demeanor. some literary sense to this election. Well, I wouldn't know, but I, I mean, what remains in question is whether. Nick Clegg has the power to disrupt the two-party system. Um, will he? Will will he make a difference so that there is a referendum on electoral reform? What? Or is this a bubble that's already? Yeah, the, 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 this doesn't look like we're going to get a referendum. No, I mean, well. Like if the results of the constitutional. What is so preposterous is the notion the Liberals represent anything new. They're the direct descendants of our oldest political party, the Whigs. They are the most brutally political at local government okay. level. They're as factitious as okay. That's uh, enough from the intellectuals. Let's uh, go and get some stardust here because who have I got here? But Tony Parsons, Mr. Wilson, Joan Collins, and Armando Iannucci. Joan, have you been galvanized by this election? Well, I was at a dinner party and I was trying to listen to it, but everybody was so busy chatting that they didn't put the sound on, so I don't know what's happening. I well, told the her Conservatives about... look like they're going to be the largest party. How do you feel? Good, very good. You're I'm happy very with happy. that? Yay, David Cameron. But not an overall majority so far. Well, I'm, that's too bad. All right. The final hurrah for Mr. Brown? I think so. I think a hung parliament sounds like good news to me. You would like a hung parliament? I would like, I would like PR, yes. Who do you think, uh, if, if this is a bad defeat for Labour, who should be the next Labour leader? Um, I think uh, Miliband should probably be the next Labour leader. Because, Which Miliband? Um, the, uh, there are the, two of them. The, the good looking one. Because I think that... Mm, that we, doesn't uh, help me. David, I think, uh, David, I think that for 33 years we had British Prime Ministers who were uh, educated in state schools. And I think that um, and David, the Milibans were. The Milibans right. were, and I and I think it would be a tragedy if um, those days were over. If the Lib Dems do as bad as the exit polls say, yes, haven't we just wasted 80 percent of our election coverage? Yes, you have. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, don't blame me. I didn't run them. I thought they did a shockingly well, bad. Well, you're a supporter of the Lib Dems. I am. Why are you not I doing better? I think they did a very disappointing campaign the last week. I thought they were. They didn't really capitalise on the first couple of debates and they didn't really offer anything new in the last week or so, and I think they just got a bit left behind. Now, maybe the exit polls are, are a little bit pessimistic. Well, wasn't but, it uh, because the, the policies got dragged into the spotlight? I mean, I think at first people were charmed by Nick Clegg, and he was um, breath of fresh air. Yeah. And then as, uh, as we got into like the second and third TV debate, you know, people were actually talking about Lib Dem policies and some of them are just a little bit too okay. loopy. I just want to ask, why do you think David Cameron would make a good Prime Minister? Well, I think that he's very uh, serious. I think, although he's serious, he has a sense of humour. I think he has a presidential look. And I think that he's going to be very good for the country. And I think he's very for the family, which to me is incredibly important. Right. And I think it's been forgotten with the Labour government, the family, the real family, the nuclear family. We thank you. Enjoy our event. Watch the results coming in. But for the moment, it's uh, goodbye from the boat and back to the studio. My dear Andrew, I wish we could watch some more results coming in. We've only had three so far, and we need, we need an awful lot. Actually, one of the ones we need is somewhere away from the northeast, uh, somewhere like Birmingham Edgbaston, where Gisela Stewart's fighting and Tories are hoping to do well. We just need to get a bit more around the country, but there's nothing we can do about it. And, um, I don't know, we've got places where people are apologising. 
for not being allowed to vote, they're being told that they should have been allowed to vote and they haven't, it's all fairly chaotic. But anyway, when we get results in, uh, we'll be on the case. Let's rejoin Jeremy. David, thank you very much. Well, you haven't got, uh, we haven't got Joan Collins. We have, however, got Tessa Jowell. <laughs> what a treat. The uh, Olympics there Minister. Are. What a there you are. Legal, yeah. Cover from that. Tessa. <laughs> <laughs> and now, Never can you within six can, feet of Botox. Can you just... <laughs> oh, be careful. Uh, can you just explain to us the, uh, the, the moral legitimacy of your man staying in Downing Street, despite the fact that he spent the last several weeks telling us we can only vote for him and your party, and must on no account vote for the Liberal Democrats or the Conservatives, and yet apparently is willing to govern with them. Well, as Peter Hennessy, I think, put very, uh, very clearly, it's constitutional legitimacy that requires or it entitles the incumbent Prime Minister of any party, doesn't matter who it is, entitles the incumbent Prime Minister to seek to form a government it's just... in the event that his, her own party, um, is unable to command a majority. It's, it's such a mystery, given so many of your own party wanted to get rid of him only a few months ago. No, l listen, Jeremy, it's nothing to do with any of that rather sort of exotic account you're trying to give. It is only to do with the rules by which our constitution works. OK, now, Jeremy Hunt, uh, you are the reincarnation of Eric Pickles in, 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 in the discussion now. Uh, that, nice job. Um, what do you make of this? I mean... Constitutionally, it's right, isn't it? Well, constitutionally, it is a very, very unusual situation, and there are constitutional experts and legal experts and the cabinet secretary who decide how these things work. But I think what we're seeing tonight, if the exit poll is accurate, and it is a big if because sure. it is only an exit poll, is that there has been an absolutely decisive rejection of the arguments that Gordon Brown was making to the country, and all the things that but, Tessa and her colleagues were saying is, about, you know, Gordon been... Brown's made all the right calls on the economy, the country is saying no, they want it's change, not. and that couldn't be clearer. If it had been decisive, you would have an overall majority. There has not been a decisive verdict. Well, we don't know that. I mean, we've had We've had one set of exit polls, and let's face it, this has been a different election to normal elections, and things like postal votes are not included in those exit polls, and those traditionally right. have helped Conservatives. I, I'm going to cut across to you because we've got Ken Clark now, who's been in Parliament... Much longer a than me. <laughs> a lot longer than you. You've been there since 1974 or something, haven't you, Ken Clark? I mean, I mean why, why is it that well, your leader back, so yeah, conspicuously... In 1974, we had a hung Parliament, yeah. yeah. Sure, so you know whereof you speak, uh, but why is it, first off, that your leader seems so to have cut through, not to have cut through? Well, I think the election is the most unusual one I've taken part in, and it's, it's partly the uh, disillusion with politics generally, so people are not getting enthused about anything, and they're distrustful of politicians, they're angry about the economic crisis and slightly fearful of the uh, outcome. Uh, and uh, it's also quite a complicated issue. Uh, you have the worst economic crisis since the war, and you talk to different economists, expert economists, and they have slightly different solutions. And so the central issue is involved asking people a question uh, upon which it's, it's possible to have a long academic debate. But if you, you, want. you so said that there has been some confusion, and it, was, it got rather hijacked for a time by a, a TV celebrity talent contest, which uh, uh, did actually open things up and uh, improve things, and actually brought the issues over to the public a bit as well. But it's not like Hang on a second, the old Kent Clark, elections we're just where you've got a big um, swing Gordon from one Brown to the other. And his wife uh, arrive at their account, I think, in Kakoldi there. Oh, you, you can't miss a picture of Gordon Brown arriving at his camp. No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> There's no call for that sort of comment. We have now seen him arriving at his camp. Well, the other channels got very excited about a picture of David Cameron's car driving away from his home. <laughs> That is the magic of television, you see. <laughs> <laughs> now, you said absolutely unequivocally during the course of the campaign that even an outright Labour victory would be better than a hung parliament. If this exit poll, and I agree it's a big if, if this exit poll is right and the results we've got so far, we are going to get what you said would be a disaster for this country. I, I, I don't, the, the quote you've given is a slightly improved version of something I said uh, before the election, but all the way through I've said a hung parliament could be a disaster, and I still think it could be a disaster. Fortunately, this one, we don't know yet. I mean, let me put the caveat in that everybody else does, uh, which is 
that uh, it's very difficult to do exit polls in this particular election. The voting pattern is more complicated, so if it turns out to be right, it'll be a very good guess, the election the exit poll we're working on at the moment. It'll be different in different parts of the country, and we don't know where the Liberal votes are actually going to fall and what they're going to do uh, to the balance between the other two parties in particular places. So it's very difficult. So, But, but it looks as though there's still a serious risk of a hung parliament, but with the Conservatives, not too far off, and obviously the biggest single party. The one certainty, I think, is that Gordon Brown has been removed from office. It would be a complete travesty if Gordon Brown tried to carry on as Prime Minister, even worse if he was made Prime Minister, because he's plainly been rejected and lost all authority to govern. Kenneth Clark, thank you. Just very quickly, Simon, he's just shaking your head well, furiously. The, the Tories can't have it both ways. They have always believed that the system is first past the post and you have to get more than half the people in Parliament. You can't then say, we haven't got first, we haven't got the majority, but we still claim the right to govern. They absolutely have to be consistent. Now, the, some right. of us say we need a different system, but they've never said that. I'm being instructed to hand back to David. David. You're so obedient, Jeremy. What's got I'm, into you? I'm being nice to you, David. Get on with it. We go. No, I won't go back to you for a bit. We'll go to Birmingham, Edgbaston, and um, join Patrick Byrne. Patrick, what's the story there? When, when are we going to get a result from Edgbaston? Well, we're counting on a truly industrial scale here. They're doing everything they can down there to fast track the Edgbaston count. It is famously an early declarer. It was the first marginal to declare in 1997 for new Labour. And the original estimate was something like 1245, but because of a higher than expected turnout, up in the upper 60s possibly in percentage terms. Well, this in common with other constituencies just might be put back. The interesting thing is uh, talking to Conservatives in Edgbaston is that they're becoming increasingly confident that they're seeing a swing in excess of that that's indicated by the uh, BBC's exit poll uh, and they only need a swing of 2% to overturn Labour's notional majority of 1,500 held by Labour's Gisela Stewart. So there's increasing confidence in the Conservative ranks that they've more than achieved that on an increased turnout. Uh, any idea when we get it? Well, I'm hearing that it could be possibly 20, 25 minutes later than the 12.45, so the, the other side of one o'clock. OK, well, it's when we expect to get a lot of results uh, in, isn't it, actually, that? Uh, I'm joined by Rory Kettlin jones um, and you've, you've been looking at Twitter and Facebook. Well, Facebook was actually taken down today, wasn't it? Because there was some, somebody had got hacked into it and they abolished it. But is there a lot of fuss about this row about voting, people not able to vote? Well, actually, what we've seen, David, today on Twitter and Facebook, and Facebook is, it has still been running, is an enormous amount of comment and activity about voting. I've got in front of me on, on, um, on Twitter, somebody's Twitter page, where they tell the whole story of the, of the night, really. They've put this picture up saying, really bad organisation in Hackney North, a lot of people not getting in. This person then goes through the whole story with uh, people queuing outside, meat wagons congregated outside, the police obviously called, and then uh, 100 people not getting in. And I'm seeing more tweets. Here's another one. Sitting at Hackney polling station as people not being allowed to vote. Uh, and another one. This one is in Birmingham. Hundreds of voters rejected from St Paul's Church polling station due to inadequate staffing and facilities. And what we're generally getting is a picture of people turning up uh, in droves, really, from uh, young people that, that are on these social networks, very enthusiastic about, uh, about it, turning up and being disappointed. Um, and this kind of reflects just how much enthusiasm I think there has been through these social networks. Just one other thing, uh, Facebook had a counter on its page allowing you to tell if you'd voted. Uh, that's where it reached at about 10 to 10 uh, tonight. Uh, 1.7 million people uh, just going onto Facebook to say we voted. A lot of enthusiasm, but a, a, a degree of anger from people who've turned up and then say they've not been allowed it, it, in. It's disastrous, if, if they, particularly if it's young people wanting to vote for the first time. Perhaps they'll have to change the hours. Nick. Very briefly, thanks to Tweet and, the, uh, and yes. Twitter. We've got one from the Tories who's saying they're taken Battersea. We haven't got the result itself, but the head of press of the Tory party twitters and he's telling us uh, that the Conservative Party have taken the seat in Battersea or expect to. OK, well, uh, we'll join Martha Carney down there in a bit and get it. Let's have a look at the smaller parties. We haven't talked about them much or we haven't had many results in. But we will be watching the smaller parties. Uh, important, both parties in Wales and Scotland and the other smaller parties too. Emily. 
Yes, if there's one political slogan that's stuck throughout the course of this campaign, it's not been from the politicians themselves necessarily, but from the voters, that constant refrain, they're all the same. Will this be the election where voters go away from the main parliamentary parties towards the smaller parties, or at least some of the individuals that represent them? We've picked out a few here, and the first one I'm going to take you to is uh, Buckingham. That comes up for me. Nigel Farage, you will have heard in the headlines today, narrowly escaped uh, a plane crash. He'll be watching this count from his hospital bed. The former leader of UKIP is defying the convention uh, that says the main political parties don't stand where the Speaker has a seat, John Burko. Nigel Farage standing on an anti-Westminster sleaze ticket, and you might have seen his campaign, the Dolphin, flip-flopping, which he says represents uh, the flip-flopping of houses that MPs have taken in. Uh, Peter, no real chance of taking this. We don't think so, but because it's not a normal contest um, between the parties, we have no real idea. In a normal contest, as we see here, the Conservatives have three times as many votes as Labour, so if it were a normal Conservative Labour Lib Dem contest, we'd say John Burke will be back with a huge majority. I'd be surprised if Nigel Farage took it, but it is one of the sort of jokers in the pack tonight. OK, let's have a look at another one then. If I move us on to uh, Barking, uh, where Nick Griffin, the leader of the BNP, is contesting uh, the Labour Minister, Margaret Hodge. I'll show you what that share of the vote looks like. The BNP, interesting enough, in third place last time round, just one percentage point behind the Conservatives mm. there. It's not a close rate. Margaret Hodge has a large majority, but the BNP have eight out of nine seats on the council. They'll be hoping at the end of this evening, if not, to get that seat to secure the council. There's been a glass ceiling. Go back to Oswald Mosley's party in the 30s, the National Front in the 70s. In parliamentary elections, they've never got above 16, 17 per cent. So if, if Nick Griffin can get above 20, get to 25 per cent, he might not win it, but that would be a, a breakthrough. Can I just say one other thing? There's another seat the BNP are interested in up in Oldham, uh, where Phil Wallace, the immigration minister, one of their pet hates, uh, is standing for re-election. The Liberal Democrats have been targeting that and they're saying, I hear, that they failed in Oldham and that the Liberal Democrats are falling back rather than advancing. Phil Willis looks safe. Interesting one to watch. This is one seat uh, which might actually change hands this evening. Caroline Lucas, the leader of the Greens, uh, got a remarkable uh, percentage of the vote last time round. Just one point behind the Conservatives in third place. A very credible candidate, an MEP for the last ten years or so. In this alternative city of uh, Brighton uh, Pavilion, she could really take this. And look, we've been getting Labour falling back eight, ten points. If that happens in Brighton, it's a three-way marginal contest. If Caroline Lucas can get the tactical votes going for her, this could be the first Green parliamentary victory in, in the British House of Commons. Peter, thanks. The exit polls suggest there hasn't been a great swing to or from these smaller parties, but they might throw up some of these individual, as Peter said, jokers in the pack, which we'll watch with interest. David. Thanks, Emily. Uh, well, Justin Rowlett is in Brighton Pavilion, and we go down to him... Uh, Justin, what's your impression of what's happened there? Well, the word here is that Caroline Lucas, the leader of the Green Party, probably has taken Brighton Pavilion tonight. Now, I've heard that from the chairman of the party who says he's quietly confident the Greens have taken the seat. I've also spoken to one of the other candidates and she says that she believes the Greens have won. Now, I should say the votes haven't actually started being counted here, but that is what they're saying. And the Greens have fought a really, almost a national campaign here in Brighton. Today, apparently, there were 200 volunteers out making sure that people who told canvases that they were going to vote Green got out. People were getting three or four phone calls to make sure that they went out and delivered their vote. Having said that, as you saw in the statistics there, this is a, a three-way module, possibly even with a Lib Dem surge of four-way module. So it's by no means certain. But word is now, Caroline Lucas, the leader of the Green Party, has won the first ever seat for the Green Party in the British Parliament. We'll only know for certain that when the Cape count comes in, it should be around 2, 2.30 today. Thanks, Justin. Well, that's the effect of love bombing Brighton Pavilion. The pictures you can see on the screen there is... Uh, David Cameron arriving at his count at Whitney and it'll be interesting I don't know whether he'll say anything there about the results his henchmen have been talking away about how things have been we've heard George Osborne uh, talking about the uh, right of the Tories to take over and the need for firm government and all the rest of it and when he turns up at Whitney we shall perhaps hear something from him I think he's going first to a, a pub first of all the new inn in Whitney to watch the results. I think he needs a pint after yesterday when he was completely on the road 
all night long, right across the country, Grimsby, all over the shop, showing that he was alive and well and able to govern. And um, Nick, what do you make of the way his campaign has gone? It must have been, you were close to it, it must have been rather a blow when he didn't win the first debate. I think not only that, David, but there was panic initially uh, in David Cameron's team that they simply couldn't get this election campaign going. They had this great campaign to expose what they called Labour's jobs tax that they said they'd reverse on national insurance, all these businessmen lining up, and yet somehow it gave them no momentum. And again and again, they tried to get this campaign going. It never went wrong. I mean, it was always slick. It was always smooth. Mr Cameron never really put a wrong, foot wrong, and yet it failed utterly to take off at any stage in the campaign and therefore you were seeing polls a lot of the time that were saying a vast number of people over 75 percent of people told pollsters that it was time for a change but less than half that number said that they thought it was a time for a change to him and that will be the difficulty and if he doesn't get a majority tonight he will be able to say that he can govern but if he uh, doesn't have a majority there will people be people and we're already hearing them from the Labour Party saying he's not really one he's not really got the confidence of the public and at the time he's got such big problems that is a problem in itself. David Cameron with his wife Samantha going into the pub. Andy Ty is there, our reporter with them. Andy. Well, nothing there from David Cameron as he went into this pub. There's about 80 or so party members been uh, queuing up all night to spend the evening with him. He's going to spend some time with them now watching the results come in, but nothing as he entered the pub this evening in Whitney, where I understand he's a bit of a regular. It's owned by a local party official. Plenty of rosettes in there, plenty of people so far this evening satisfied with what the exit polls are showing, but they, as everyone else knows, that it's uh, a long night ahead. Well, thanks very much, Andy, and uh, we'll no doubt see David Cameron when he comes out to his count. Uh, so just go back to where we were, uh, Peter, before. Um, your, your view, you, you've expressed very clearly about how, you know, the Queen mustn't be put in an embarrassing position and she's already said she won't see anybody till after lunch today anyway. Um, what I'm not clear about from what you say is whether you think Gordon Brown will in reality try and put something together with the Liberal Democrats or whether the fact of a, a major defeat, if that's what it is, will, he'll, he'll call it a day, draw stumps and say I resign. I have a feeling, it's only that, that like all Prime Ministers, at a moment of acute disappointment, the overall feeling might be that going with dignity is the best thing to do, because political history is pretty tough on people. Very often the nature of their farewell, their exit, their last hurrah, colours their reputation for a very long time. And if you appear to cling on by your fingernails, even if the Constitution allows you to, it's not dignified. We all remember, although it was a very clear result in 1997, the immense dignity with which John Major behaved and going off to Oval to see a cricket match and so on. And I think those close to him will probably say that, just as Dennis Thatcher did to Mrs Thatcher in November 1990, when he told her it really is the time to go, even if you can hang on constitutionally quite legitimately. Well, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, very briefly, oh, Nick, well, I, I want to... to say in front of the great professor of contemporary history, but there are examples from the 1920s in which the second party does end up governing, and I think they will argue we're in an era like we were then of three-party politics with doubts about the electoral system, and Gordon Brown may well try. We're, we're, I hope in a moment we're going to be able to talk to Jenny Watson at the Electoral Commission, who's in, down at Westminster, but apparently we can't quite speak to her for the moment. We've got to sort that out and then we will. We've got a long list of places to put to her, but the latest news is that voters in Hackney South have been turned away an hour before the polls closed, saying there was no way they could, they could uh, vote. Jenny Watson, um, what does the Electoral Commission make of this? It sounds like a disgrace from beginning to end the way this election's been handled. Well, it's clearly a, a very serious concern. I mean, the thing that is astonishing to me is that every, uh, every presiding officer, everybody in charge of a polling station today will have a copy of our guidance, which in fact I have with me here, that is extremely clear uh, that the doors to the polling station must be closed at exactly 10 o'clock, 
that anybody who has been issued with a ballot paper by 10 o'clock must be allowed to vote and that nobody may be issued with a ballot paper after 10 o'clock even if they are inside the polling station and waiting for the ba their ballot paper. So the law is extremely clear and our guidance is extremely clear. So now, of what, course, what happens we, then if they've broken the law? Do they get fined? Do they go to jail? What happens to these people? Well, we can't tell returning officers and election staff what to do. We do not have that power of direction. They well, so are the law isn't clear because they don't have to obey the law? No. It, perhaps I could finish. The law is extremely clear. They have the guidance. They should have done what the law says. If they haven't done that, and I'm not going to comment on individual constituencies, particularly when we don't yet know the results, they may well be subject to election petitions. But I must be clear, we don't have the power to tell them or instruct them what to do. Now clearly we're going to look at this, clearly Parliament will want to look at this and it may well be that the, the law will need to change. We've been saying for some time that the system that we have is at breaking point and I think what you see here tonight is, is clearly a need for either greater coordination or for us to have clearer powers of direction and we're but, going to want to return to that and so will Parliament. But how can people run out of ballot papers? Surely they know how many people are on their electoral roll. How can Chester, according to the Labour Party, have 600 people who haven't been put on the roll even though they're registered? Well, how can Sheffield Hallam lock people out, Newcastle lock people out, problems at Leeds and Birmingham and Manchester and Lewisham and Hackney? and Liverpool, Wavertree and Garston and Islington South and Newcastle and Peniston and Stocksbridge. I mean, the list is just growing by the hour. This is a significant concern and those are questions that individual returning officers who are legally accountable for the decisions that they make based on their own local knowledge and knowledge of circumstances, they will have to answer to us and they will have to answer to local voters. And what I would have expected to see during the course of the day when it became clear that turnout was higher than they'd anticipated was for them to deploy additional resources, was for them to think this through in advance, to put extra staff on, to be moving ballot papers perhaps from one polling station to another to be getting extra ballot papers. This is the kind of local knowledge that they have which, which our system relies on, which means they should be making those decisions. And people in charge of local polling stations should have been feeding that information back to the returning officer and saying, I need additional resources, you need to provide that. Why With is the it, system why is it that we so have, creaky then? You say, you say we've long been arguing the system had to change. Why has it started to creak? Is it the population, the size of the population, the size of the constituencies? What is it? What we have is largely a legacy from the Victorian era when you had tiny numbers of people who had the vote. I mean, it's been changed since then, but nobody's had a fundamental look at how the system is administered. And we've been saying for some time that it is not sensible to have a system that was designed when maybe 5 million people had, had the vote at a time when 45 million people had the vote. And at some point, uh, that system was going to, was going to fall over. But we managed to hold elections in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s, long after the franchise was changed to get people on significantly higher turnouts than there has been today. Anybody would think there'd been a revolution today, that millions of people extra had voted. By our own figures, we're talking of a few extra percentage points on turnout, which was hugely down at the last election and the one previously. We're not talking of some unprecedented surge of people at the polling stations or indeed some new systems. I am baffled as to know why it should be so much harder to do this time than it was in th the pr previous right. three decades. Well, Jenny Watson, you will no doubt be very, very busy. I, well, and indeed, and I, it is a serious concern, and they will have to answer to us for the decisions that they've made. Yes, and uh, if they can't answer, nothing will happen to them. Well, uh, that's, that's clearly not feasible, is it? Clearly the law is going to have to be reviewed and changed, and, and we'll be making recommendations for change, and I'm sure Parliament will want to look at it. Okay. And those individu individual decisions are ones that they'll have to answer to local voters for, and there may well be election petitions following this. Jenny Watson, thanks very much. We've had one more result in. We've now had five declarations. This one from Northern Ireland, West Tyrone, Sinn Féin holding it, Pat Doherty, the majority of 10,685, and that's the fifth result in, a victory for Sinn Féin, and a swing there to Sinn Féin from the Democrat Unionist Party, from the Unionist to the Nationalists, 3.8 per cent. Good. Well, it's now um, 20 to 1 in the morning, and we might, I think, have just a summary of how things stand with Fiona. Fiona.
Yes, indeed. And we have two big stories tonight. First of all, the exit poll, which is suggesting that we are heading for a hung parliament. But then, as we were hearing just then from the Electoral Commission, it says it will be undertaking a review of what's gone wrong in a number of constituencies where hundreds of people have been unable to vote. A number of polling stations closed by the deadline at 10 o'clock, with long queues of people still waiting outside. There have been extraordinary scenes. At one camp, for example, at Fallowfield in Manchester, where hundreds of people were turned away, a crowd of local residents challenged local officials. Should have got more staff in, should have got it more prepared, more, more staff should have done it properly, everything. If you're trying to wash your hands of it, people have missed out their votes out there, it's again, totally wrong. Years time. Well, the Labour Deputy Leader, Harriet Harman, said results are potentially open to a legal challenge if they are close. A polling station in Wavertree had to turn away voters after it ran out of ballot papers. And this was a scene in Sheffield Hallam, Nick Clegg's constituency, with people queuing round the block as the 10 o'clock deadline approached. As police were called in to move people on, one local resident voiced her frustration. They could have had some sort of contingency plan, and I think it's shocking that that the communication, even to, to send somebody with a loudspeaker. I mean, in Afghanistan, I think the process went smoother than this. It's shocking. There's about 100 people who haven't been able to vote, who were really cared. I mean, it was pouring with rain. So, you know, we take it very seriously, and it's terribly undemocratic. And I think everybody's very angry. Hear, yeah. hear. Yeah. Well, the returning officer at that count in Sheffield gave this reaction. We've had a phenomenal turnout, probably the highest turnout in 30 years. A large student demographic in, in that ward. Um, a lot of new students arriving, no local elections last year. A lot of new voters. It caught us out. I, I'm not blaming anybody. We need to get this right. Well, we are getting reports of counts and where people have been turned away and able to vote from all over the country. But so far, five seats have been declared and the exit poll is suggesting we are heading for a hung parliament. The first since 1974. The Conservatives would be the largest party, but would not have overall control. The poll suggests the Conservatives would have the most seats at 305, but that would leave them 21 seats short of an outright majority. Labour would have 255, and the Liberal Democrats would be in third place with 61, other parties with 29. Now, it's worth saying, of course, all polls have a margin of error, which could well be significant in such a tight election. And we'll get a clearer picture as more results come in. And incidentally, as well as following us live here in the studio, you can check every detail, follow live updates from your constituency right through to the final result online. That's at bbc.co.uk slash election. So tonight, extraordinary scenes at some polling stations as people were turned away without being able to vote. And our exit poll is suggesting a hung parliament. Thanks so much, Fiona. Uh, another result in from Northern Ireland, North Antrim. There's Ian Paisley Jr., Ian Paisley's son, has held his uh, seat, or held the seat in North Antrim. Ian Paisley's father stood down here. Despite a challenge from Jim Allister, of the traditional unionist voice, who was against all the agreements that uh, Ian Paisley and the DUP were in favor of in Northern Ireland. So challenging from the traditional old unionist position, and he got 7,000 votes and uh, failed to take the seat, Sinn Féin in third place. And incidentally, the uh, Ulster Conservative and Unionists, who we may hear more of later tonight, in fourth place. That's Erwin Armstrong there. Those are the Unionists who have said they will support the Conservative Party at Westminster. Good. So, where are we now? We've got uh, 10.45, quarter to one. Let's join Jeremy Paxman. And uh, I'm joined now by Margaret Hodge, who's uh, being opposed in her constituency of Barking by Nick Griffin, the leader of the BNP. Um, How does it look to be going there? Um, I think it's going quite well, really. Uh, it's been the toughest life battle of my life, really, Jeremy. The one I feel has been a real moral battle for democratic values as opposed to fascist values. And uh, what my tellers tell me is that the count is going well, but we're probably going to have to wait till three o'clock, four o'clock to get the actual result. Did what I was hoping was I turned the threat into an opportunity to really uh, smash this wave of fascism. We, you know, fascism comes in waves yeah, in yeah, British yeah. politics, Look, and this are, is the latest one. We understand that Go you on. find their views repellent, but did you come to understand why they appear to be garnering such support? Well, I think. The answer is it's a complex set of issues. 
uh, this is an area where the pace of change as a result of immigration has probably been faster than anywhere else in the country. And the reason that's happened is that in this area it was primarily all council owned. And when we in the right to buy was introduced, about half the housing was privatised. And that led to a very swift change in who was living the, in the housing, either by who bought the homes or because people bought to let and often let to other London councils like Westminster, Tower Hamlets, places like that, who house their homeless families here. So the pace of change was one thing. Job losses, if you think Fords used to employ 40,000 people, they now employ 4,000, and that's a fantastic restructuring of the economy. That also was another issue. Uh, and I think there were other issues like okay. both... <laughs> Go on. We'll, get, we'll, we'll get back to you, I think, at, at your count. But if you'll excuse me, I, we're going to go away now and we're going to talk to uh, Danny Alexander, who is Nick Clegg's uh, Chief of Staff right-hand man. Are you really proposing to keep Gordon Brown in Downing Street? Uh, what we're proposing to do is to listen to what the uh, voters are saying in this election. At the moment, we're getting a great deal of premature election speculation from the other two parties. We're getting a sense of, a uh, sort of arrogant sense from the Conservatives that they should somehow... Uh, inherit power. We, we've only had five constituencies first. We've had an exit poll which I think people know are notoriously unreliable. The last time you may remember in 1992 the exit poll called it for one party, the other party won the election. Yes, yes, yes. We've got a long yeah, way yeah, to okay, go now. So we're, not, we we're proposing to listen to the people of this country. No, we understand before, that, but your, your leader went through this election. Hang on a second, I'm going to have to cut to you. We're going to go to Belfast, I think. Okay, sure. 65, 365, <clears throat> Niall O'Donnell, 817, 817. Trevor Ringland, <coughs> 7,305, 7,305. Peter Robinson, 11,306, 11,306. David Vance, 1,856, 1,856. There were 124 rejected ballot papers and I declare that Naomi Long has been elected to serve in Parliament for the East Belfast constituency. So, this is a very surprising result. Peter Robinson, First Minister of Northern Ireland, who temporarily stood down earlier last year, has been defeated in Belfast East. The Alliance Party has gained it from the Democratic Unionists. Naomi Long was in third place last time goes top of the poll there with a majority of 1,500. The Democratic Unionist, Peter Robinson, defeated, is in second place. And the Ulster Conservative and Unionist, Trevor Ringland, in third place. And here's the swing. Look, it almost wipes out our swingometer. So that is a massive defeat for Peter Robinson. 22%, 30%, 30% swing. 22.9% uh, swing. Right, well, that's, yes. Absolutely extraordinary story for Peter Robinson to have lost. One can only assume that this is linked to the scandal that he and his wife uh, were involved in earlier, but has real implications for power sharing in Northern Ireland now. Peter Robinson, as First Minister, was critical in bringing his party into the process of alignment with Sinn Féin, getting the agreement that was necessary to keep power sharing going. And for him to be defeated will raise real questions about where that goes now. Vernon? This could be a very significant result for Northern Ireland. The Alliance Party, it's the first time they've ever won a seat. They're a party which pride themselves on not allying themselves with either of the two communities in Northern Ireland, not the unionist community nor the nationalist community. They're a cross-community party, and they say that Northern Ireland should forget about these old squabbles and get on with more modern issues in government, the public services, the economy and so on. So it's a highly significant issue, a strongly uh, party in favour of power sharing, uh, as the Liberal Democrats are in Britain. They're allied to the Liberal Democrats. It's a very striking result, I think. Right, let's go back to Andrew Neil on the Thames. Andrew. Thank you, uh, David. We've now got Alistair McGowan here, Maureen Lipman, and Toby Young. Let me start with you, Toby. Uh, you came out as a Conservative this week. I did. Are you jumping on the bandwagon? Well, um, I'm happy that uh, Cameron has got more than 300 votes, uh, well, more than 300 we think, seats. We think. We think. Um, he and, hasn't got uh, any seats at the moment. 
No, but uh, it looks like the exit poll is reasonably accurate. Should uh, he it, govern as a minority government if that's what it is? Well, you know, should given, he do a deal with the Liberals? Given what we've heard tonight, some people haven't been able to vote. We've got an inconclusive result. Maybe we should do it all again. And Andrew, I'm looking forward to being here again in about four weeks' time. Yeah, that's just because you like a, a party. <laughs> Maureen Lippmann, what have you thought about this campaign as it went uh, through its amazing ups and downs? It was good to have a television debate. I didn't think it was going to be. You like the debates? Uh, it turned out very well. It galvanised the people into voting. It was nothing more than a pop idol X Factor load of nonsense. It didn't do any good for Gordon because he's not televisual. It did a lot for Clegg, which is now not proving the same at the polls. Uh, um, you know, what, what have we come to, really? If that's the way we vote, then Winston Churchill would never have gotten anywhere. Alison McGowan, are you going to have to... Can you do David Cameron? Uh, no, I've been working hard on you, Andrew. You've been on television more recently. <laughs> and like you, I've been asking myself the three most important questions lately. Who's that, James Nocte? It's you. Oh, it's, it's me. You. Sorry. I've I, been asking the most I important questions. I didn't realize three questions. I thought it was Kirsty Wark. If you let me finish now, you're doing what you do to everybody else. Oh. Is Nick going to give the Lib Dems a cleg up? If Labour don't win, will they be browned off? And if the Tories don't win, will it be a case of wham, bam, thank you, Cam? Let's find out. Andrew and, Neal's here. And what about the Millibands? Can you do either of them? No, I can't do the Millibands. The, the You've person, got a lot of work to do there. Got, well, I don't do politicians, so it's fine. But it's interesting, a lot of celebrities have been throwing their weight behind various parties. And I heard Eddie Izzard talking about the Labour, for the Labour Party, and he was saying, you know, we've got to follow Europe and uh, take a leaf out of Belgium's book. You know, we've got to ban the burger in public places. People are eating burgers in public, getting mayonnaise all over their faces. We've got to ban the burger. It's not good for people. Jam sandwiches all around. Yeah. I like that kind of sandwich. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, people were having to queue to get into polling stations tonight. Some people didn't even get a boat. Quite remarkable happening in one of the most sophisticated democracies in the world. People had to queue. I almost tripped there to get into this party too. Who have I got here? But two snows in a May day. If you were commenting on this exit poll as we wait for more results to come in. What would you be saying? I'd be saying, Andrew, we've seen some exciting elections in our time, but this is the most exciting I've ever seen. I've done 12 elections altogether. I know. Way, I'm enjoying this one more than any other because I'm not involved, which is wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. But this is extraordinary. I mean, here we have Cameron with a sort of comfortable leader of the other parties in the exit poll, but massively short of an overall majority. I mean, that, those 20 seats are very, very important indeed. And if you add the Labour Party and the Lib Dems together, they're more than Cameron. It's fascinating. And yet they still don't have an overall majority. No, no they oh. don't. Not yet. Although, as in 92, when Dad was wrong in the exit poll, I'm still... No, I'm sorry, that I'm didn't happen. I'm still not sure. Never. I think. But I think He has never been wrong. But what's amazing about the exit poll for me is, despite a surge in Liberal Democrat votes, they are not getting any more seats. In fact, they're getting less seats. And it shows that they're... We need radical constitutional reform in this country. And I'm going to win my bet with Dan, aren't I, Dan? What's the bet? The bet is Dan thinks that Cameron's going to get an overall majority. I bet him 50 quid that Cameron wouldn't quite make it. Uh, the exit bills, yes, he won't quite make it. But I, I must admit, I could be wrong. <laughs> but either way, you're saying it looks like Conservatives, certainly the largest party, and maybe an overall majority. It looks that way at the moment, which I think is a, is a, it's a disgrace for our democracy, I have to say. That he can... So much depends on what happened. The Torbay result, the first Lib Dem con seat we have in, can tell us an awful lot. All at right. the moment, the swing appears to be the Conservatives in those hit with the Lib Dems. Okay. But if the Lib Dems can start taking seats from con, then they're in business. All right. It's been great to have you both on an election program again. And let's go back to David in the election centre. David. Thanks very much. We've got a Liberal Democrat seat, Thornbury and Yate. Let's just have a look at that. And this is a Conservative hold in Thornbury and Yate in South Yorkshire. Uh, but the majority is 7,000. It's down from 11,000. Liberal Democrats take it. Conservatives in second place. And have a look at this swing, which is interesting. Swing from Liberal Democrats to Conservatives, 4.3%. Now, if that's repeated in the Southwest, there are seats held by the Liberal Democrats that could fall to the Conservatives on that figure. Let's just go over to Belfast and hear from Peter Robinson, defeated there. Representative of First Minister East Belfast of Northern Ireland. Uh, I hand that uh, task and responsibility uh, over to Naomi. And I know that she will 
fulfil the trust of the people of East Belfast as uh, she works on their behalf uh, at Westminster and in the, the constituency. Uh, of course there will be many people who will look at the election and they will draw their own conclusions about uh, my defeat. I have to say that uh, from a personal point of view I had indicated to many people that I had preferred not to stand in this election. You should always uh, be careful what you wish for uh, in politics. Uh, however, I have to say that uh, I have a job to do and I have a job to complete with my mandate in the Assembly. I will continue to carry out that important work. I think it is vital for the sake of Northern Ireland that we continue the momentum moving forward. I'm glad that that is the overwhelming view of people across Northern Ireland. It is vital that uh, we do not go back to the bad old days of the past, though there are those who would seek to drag us there. Even tonight we have seen that there are those who would like to do it by the bomb, and in the uh, election we have seen those who would like to do it through the ballot box. But we will continue to look positively at the future of Northern Ireland, and we will ensure that the people of Northern Ireland have a bright and better future. And no matter in what role I may be able to play my part, I will always do my best to get the best deal for the people of Northern Ireland. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. So that was the defeated Peter Robinson, First Minister of Northern Ireland. Defeated, he stays in the Assembly, he's First Minister of Northern Ireland, but defeated uh, at his seat by the Alliance Party, getting their first MP in Westminster. One other result. Darlington, a Labour hold in Darlington in the North East. Jenny Chapman holds it, but the swing is interesting here, a swing from Labour to the Conservatives of 9%, just over 9%. And Durham North, and in Durham North, again a Labour hold, a similar swing, 8.9% swing from Conservatives to Labour. So, and David Cameron, I think, just arriving in his count now at Whitney, having been to the pub and um, greeted Tory friends there and he and his wife arriving at their count. Now we've been talking about Northern Ireland because we had Northern Ireland results in. We've had news just there of applied Cymru gain in Avon in Wales. First applied Cymru gain. Let's just talk about Scotland. Emily. Yes, I've put the map on this modified version so you can see very clearly uh, the battle that lies ahead for the Conservatives in Scotland. They've just got that one seat, Dumfrieshire, but I'm going to take you to some of their targets, what they're hoping to come away with at the end of the night. Dumfries and Galloway right next door to the one they have already. They hope to take this from Labour. It's a fairly uh, tight battle going on. What about Edinburgh South? This is interesting, a three-way marginal with the Lib Dems right in the middle here. They want this too, want this too. And uh, let me just take you to one more, Angus. The SNP at the moment would have to uh, be pushed off the top slot by the Conservatives. Peter, I'm just going to bring you in on this last one as well. Renfrey Charis, this is a, a very key one for the Conservatives because they could see the Scottish Secretary of State, uh, Jim Murphy, toppled here if they took this. Which of these is really looking possible or likely? Well, I'm not sure any of them are. Dumfries and Galloway, the word is that the Conservatives haven't taken that. That was the Labour seat in Scotland with the smallest majority over to the Conservatives. We don't know what's happening in Angus. As for Edinburgh South, the word is that the Liberal Democrats seem to be taking that from Labour, not the Conservatives. Now, why does this matter? As you said, only one Conservative seat in Scotland. There may be just one or two at the end of the night. If there's a David Cameron minority government, he'll, he'll do it without any real help from Scotland. And in Scottish politics, what will they make of it? What will Alex Salmon, the First Minister, make of it when he says, look, we're run by a party that has practically no representation in Scotland. So it's not just, as it were, a cephalogically interesting thing that Scotland is behaving differently from England, but the political consequences of that difference could be very significant. Yeah, a real constitutional headache, potentially. We'll leave that one for you. Thanks very much. We're leaving the BBC's coverage of Britain's parliamentary elections here on C-SPAN 3, but you can continue to watch it on our companion network.